Welcome everybody. I now call the May 9th, 2023 regular city council meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The City of Bothell is now providing the option of attending council meetings remotely or in person. Public comment will be allowed both in writing or verbally. Verbal comments may be taken either in person or remotely. Sign-up sheets were provided online by the City Clerk's Office via link from the agenda. A call-in phone number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to listen live to the meeting. If you have called in, we ask that you mute your device. If a participant fails to mute their connection and causes a disruption to the meeting, the connection will be terminated. For our study session item, we're trying something new this evening. We will recess and set up conference tables here in chambers and conduct the study session from here. If attending virtually, there is no need to break your connection. At this point, we'll take a moment to take roll call of the council members by position number. Please say here when the city clerk calls your name. Council member Zorns. Here. Mayor Thompson. Here. Council member Aldirks. Here. Council member McNeil. Here. Council member Mankey. Council member Dodd. Here. Deputy Mayor Cabra. Here. All present with the exception of Council Member Mankey, who's absent and excused. Thank you, City Clerk. Next, I'd like to reiterate some meeting guidelines. For remote meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. Mute your microphone when not speaking. And the first item on the agenda is meeting agenda approval. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Seeing none. Uh, we'll move on to presentations, reports, and briefings. I think we have public engagement opportunities. Our middle housing survey is open through May 18th. You can share your thoughts about current middle housing proposals by taking the survey. We have a sidewalk survey is open through May 15th. You can share your thoughts on how we can make sidewalks, paths, and crossings safer for pedestrians. We also have a dog watcher walk dog walker watch class um, Thursday, May 18th at 6 p.m. Um, calling all dog walkers. Learn how and when to call 911 when spotting suspicious activity in your neighborhood. Next up, we have a proclamation for safe boating and paddling week. We cut it up. Whereas on average, 650 people die each year in boating-related accidents in the U.S., with the vast majority of those accidents caused by human error and poor judgment, and not by the boat, equipment, or environmental factors. And whereas a significant number of voters, uh, boaters who lose their lives by drowning each year would be alive today had they worn their life jackets, and whereas a large number of Bothell's residents of all ages engage in recreational boating, and whereas the city of Bothell encompasses the Sammamish River, Lake Pleasant, and other waterways, and whereas the mission of the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary is to promote and improve recreational boating safety by teaching boating safety courses and conducting vessel safety checks. Now, therefore, I, Mason Thompson, Mayor of Bothell, Washington, do hereby proclaim May 20th through 26th as Safe Boating and Paddling Week in the city of Bothell and encourage all residents to learn about and practice safe boating. And I believe we have Reed here to accept. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Thompson, esteemed members of the city of Bothell and fellow residents, thank you for the opportunity to address you in this important occasion. As a proud resident myself and a dedicated volunteer of the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary, I'm honored to stand before you to accept the proclamation of Safe Boating and Paddling Week. This proclamation serves as a powerful reminder of our shared responsibility to ensure safety on the waterways and to foster a culture of responsible boating and paddling in our beautiful city. I'd like to express my gratitude for Mayor Thompson and the City Council for their dedication to promoting safe boating and paddling in Bothell. Your proclamation not only reflects your commitment to the safety of our residents, but also helps create a safer, more enjoyable experience for all who visit our waterways. To the public, I encourage you to take this, this opportunity to familiarize yourself with the boating safety guidelines and to make 
a conscious effort to prioritize safety in all your water-based activities. Remember, a little preparation goes a long way in ensuring a safe and enjoyable experience on the water. In closing, I'd like to remind everyone that while we enjoy the beauty and excitement of our waterways, safety should always be our top priority. Through education, awareness, and responsible boating practices, we can work together to protect our loved ones and preserve the joys of boating and paddling in Bothell for generations to come. Thank you, and have a safe and enjoyable safe boating and paddling week. Thank you very much. All right, next up, we have the city manager report. City manager. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, City Council. It's a beautiful night for a council meeting. Uh, I have two, two quick updates uh, tonight. First, I wanna follow up on one of the items that was in the community outreach event, and that is to, again, encourage everyone to uh, respond to the surveys we have. We have both a sidewalk and middle housing. In regards to middle housing, uh, as you know, we had an event last, uh, last Wednesday we had roughly between 50 and 60 uh, individuals who came to participate in addition to our planning commission, city council and staff, of course, to support the event uh, and received quite a bit of, of notes and takeaway. Uh, that information will come back to council as well as the results of a, uh, a survey poll that's on the streets right now. Uh, I checked with our community development department and as of 4.30 this afternoon, we have 170 responses. Um, would love to, to continue seeing those coming. So uh, again, that is online on the city's website. There's also paper copies in the lobby of city hall available to those who would prefer to fill one out in paper form. Um, Next up is just recognizing that we are coming into a, a busy season of uh, shifting into to summer, but we know we have a number of things that the council is interested in completing before your, uh, before your break in August. Uh, two of those dates then come, are coming up in quick succession in that on June 20th, which is a Tuesday, uh, is the starting of uh, AWC event, and I know a number of council members plan to attend that. Uh, one thing that we would ask to consider is whether or not you wanna shift that meeting to June 27th. Um, again, if, if folks need more time to consider that, we can certainly finalize that next week, but I just wanted to raise it. The other one probably was already, uh, you don't need me to tell you, but the 4th of July is also on a Tuesday night. Um, our assumption with that one would be to to shift the, the meeting from that evening to the 4th Tuesday of July, which would be July 25th. Uh, I will just also say in full packaging everything, the schedule that is before you in terms of um, middle housing code amendments, which were uh, as directed to, to staff earlier this year, uh, when additional time was added, the, the request was to bring that before, wrap that up before the August break as well. That's currently scheduled to come for uh, possible action on the 18th of July. So adding a meeting on the 25th, I just wanna make it clear of that that's not a, in order to, to get that, but we are looking at having an additional meeting after the 18th as well, in case there's more time or other items that are building up on our schedule. So with that, I, I would be happy to take any feedback if there's any concerns about shifting both of those, the June meeting to from the, uh, from the 20th, so the third Tuesday to the fourth Tuesday, and then in July, we would be moving the first meeting of the month to the fourth Tuesday of the month. Does anybody have concerns with any of that? Is everybody comfortable to say, yes, do that tonight, or do we need more time? I'll have to get back to, <clears throat> to what can tentatively plan for it. I think. I'm the same. Okay. I, I'm good with uh, the June shift. July, I have a mother who's in decline, and I may need to go back the end of July to check on her, but... I know you guys would survive just fine without me, but. It's nice to have as many people here as possible in meetings. Cool. Well, y'all can get back to Kyle. 
All right, next up we have council committee reports. Council members? Council member Alders. Thank you, Mayor. I have an update from the uh, SCA Domestic Violence Initiative Task Force uh, meeting that took place. We got to meet in person for the first time in three and a half years. Um, and so that was an enjoyable experience being uh, down there and in, in person with everybody. Um, I took a lot of notes. There's some really excellent data from the King County Prosecutor's Office um, about rates and um, they uh, rates of domestic violence and how it has shifted over time, how pandemic uh, conditions affected it. Uh, and also they shared a legislative update um, and we got to receive, we received a presentation from an organization called Bridges, which is a, a diversion and intervention program for adolescent domestic violence. Um, and so just a, a really good meeting um, and good people there. So thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no more, I'm moving on. Um, the city has accepted visitor comment in writing as well as accepted sign-up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Written comments submitted to the city clerk no later than 3 p.m. today were forwarded to all city council members and are part of the record. When the clerk calls your name, you will have three minutes to speak. Please note that council will receive your input, but on the advice of our city attorney, we do not engage in discussion of these topics. Staff will make note of items requiring follow-up. City clerk, do we have anybody signed up? We do, Mayor Thompson, thank you. Uh, first off, we have one person that submitted written comment. That was Joanne Harkonnen, who wrote regarding the use of private parking space for outdoor dining, and that will be, uh, was sent to you earlier. Um, we have one person signed up to speak. That is Jeremy Tadros. Mr. Tadros, if you wanna step to the podium, um, turn on the little mic thing. You have three minutes to speak. Uh, you'll see the, the clock, the timer on the dais there, it'll, it'll be green, and at 30 seconds, it'll turn to yellow. That... Oh, cool. Um, so yeah, so uh, my name is Jeremy Tadros. Um, so I just wanted to thank council real quick for holding the community forum last week. Um, it was really cool being able to talk with our neighbors and be able to kind of hear different perspectives. Um, I also wanted to kind of speak on middle housing initiatives today as well. Um, a number of concerns were brought up in kind of our group for the forum. Um, a lot of people were kind of skeptical of the plan who were concerned about densifying too quickly or just kind of growing Bothell at all. Um, and there are a lot of valid concerns too around environment, around um, yeah, accessibility as well. Uh, but something I did not hear a whole lot about was a specific alternative plan for balanced growth, even with some people preferring just little or no growth whatsoever. Um, I'd like to kind of game out that scenario for Bothell if council opts to not have a plan or decides um, to try to prevent growth entirely. Um, as of right now, I checked this um, earlier today, the median home price in Bothell is $981,000. That's if you include condos, townhomes, and everything. If it's just single family homes, it's $1.2 million. And that's our current situation. Um, Right now, pretty much the only people who can afford homes right now are people who bought them 10, 15 years ago, people who are at the higher ends of kind of salary amounts. Um, and that would continue if there isn't really kind of any changes. Um, the people who make Bothell run, the people who make Bothell great, um, firefighters, city workers, um, minimum wage workers, people who are running and working in our businesses will not be able to afford to live in the city that they are providing and helping support. And when that happens, um, basically you're gonna lose a lot of social cohesion, you're gonna lose a lot of kind of the community that we really love here. Um, so uh, basically, I'm just trying to implore um, kind of council to really kind of consider having more middle housing options as well as kind of working regionally to uh, work with that too. But I see I'm blinking, so thank you. Oh, Thank you. That's all I have signed up to speak this evening. However, if anybody's in the audience and wishes to speak, please raise your hand or come to the podium. Mr. Swanson. Uh, just to remind the council of a couple weeks ago, I guess it was March 7th, I first brought up the fact that this affordable housing thing is kind of a ruse. Um, the minimum wage in Bothell is over $15 an hour. When I moved here, 
rent a two bedroom, one bath apartment, at Beardsley Cove apartments. Took 164 hours at 425 minimum wage to pay my rent for the two bedroom, one bath <clears throat> at 700 a month. If you multiply that 164 hours times 15.74 an hour, that means our Tara Woods is like 30% less expensive than what I moved into, and I did not move into a palace. <clears throat> 2001 was a banner year for me. I bought a car, a Nissan, five years old. It's the first car I had that had less than 100,000 miles and had air conditioning. It was a big deal. I was 41. I was commuting down to Tukwila, 28.5 miles away. One way an hour, at least. I did that for 12 years. And I did that because I bought in Bothell. I grew up in Federway. And let me tell you, my mom and dad's house in Federway, which I could have bought for 30% less, is a nice place. Still is. Hardwood floors, four bedrooms, two baths. It's a better house than I own now. But I decided to buy in Bothell. For 195000 I floated that note, making thirty-eight five. But I loved coming back home after work, even through an hour and 45 minutes commute. Why? I wanted to see out of Federal Way, because I saw the writing on the wall. I see the writing on the wall here, too. I've sacrificed to be here. And now you're bringing Federal Way to me. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience that wishes to speak? That's all, Mr. Thank you, Clerk. <clears throat> um, does anybody have anything they'd like to talk about on the projected agenda discussion? Seeing none, I will accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. Councilmember Dodd. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. We've got a motion from Councilmember Dodd to approve the consent agenda and a second from Councilmember Alders. Would anybody like to speak to the motion? It's a pretty short consent. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Councilmember Zorns. Yes. Mayor Thompson. Yes. Councilmember Alderks. Yes. Councilmember McNeil. Yes. Councilmember Dodd. Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Yes. Passes 6-0 with Councilmember Mankey Hampton and excused. Thank you. All right, our first agenda bill of the night is Agenda Bill 23066, Consideration of Ordinance Approving Board and Commission Code Amendments. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. And as you'll recall, last month, uh, some, but not all, of the Council was able to have a study session uh, to review uh, proposed changes to boards and commissions. And uh, tonight, our city clerk and city attorney are here to present to you more information. Um, the, what is coming forward for action tonight as they will uh, review is a, a subset of some of the changes that council has discussed over the past several months. Uh, this would really be focusing on recruitment schedule, some terms of service, uh, a change to the library board, a change to the salary, the salary commission as well. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our city clerk, Laura Hathaway, to lead us through the discussion. Ahead, Laura. Thank you, city manager. Um, yes, so as he explained, we, we came together on April 18th to talk about kind of the first steps, um, some of the housekeeping code amendments that we could um, implement or we're asking council to implement. Next slide, please. So tonight we're asking you to approve the proposed ordinance adjusting the recruitment schedule and terms of service, sunsetting the library board, and changing the salary commission to an ad hoc committee. Next slide. Uh, so yep, on April 18th, we presented the following recommendations. That was sunsetting the library board, streamlining terms of service, and conversion of two boards to ad hoc committees, and those were the salary commission and the shorelines board. 
Um, so council concurred at that study session with the following uh, changes. So standardizing the terms on the landmark board from a five-year to a four-year term, uh, the Arts Commission from a three-year to a four-year term with the youth terms being two years, and the Parks Board from a three-year to a four-year term with youth being two years. They also concurred with, since you also concurred with <laughs> sunsetting the Library Board, changing the Salary Commission from a standing committee to an ad hoc committee, and uh, the term, the adjustment of the terms would begin May 1, starting in 2024 and end April 30th. Council did defer the staff's recommendation to make the Shorelines Board an ad hoc committee. So what's next is um, we will have a, a second study session to focus on um, some other things that we would asking council to implement and look at. One is revisiting the Shorelines Board recommendation to make that an ad hoc committee. We'll have more information on that. Uh, the others are roles and responsibilities for both council and boards and commission, how they're gonna coordinate, and community engagement and inclusive, inclusivity and representation. So, and we are looking at September to come back to council with those recommendations. And with that, again, our council action tonight is to approve the proposed ordinance, adjusting the recruitment schedule and the terms of service, sunsetting the library board, and changing the salary commission to an ad hoc committee. And we are here to answer any questions. Council Member Zorns. Well, I was watching this at home this with ice packs and, you know, my little pity party going on, and it may have been discussed, um, uh, but I guess I should run it by our city attorney first to, to, to whether or not it's even something that we could do. We have struggled with, we have a huge community interest in serving on boards and commissions, huge, and expanding the, the head count on boards and commissions makes a lot of cooks in the ki kitchen. So I thought, if you talked about this and I missed it, my humble apologies here. But it occurred to me, I, lo I really appreciate the standardizing of going from three years to four years. Term limits are three. There's three term limits. Three, three terms. I saw, th I saw term limits of, of, maybe I misunderstood. That is not something that I reviewed when I was preparing the ordinance. Did I misunderstand what I was reading? Uh, that there were term limits for three, three, no, maybe I just misunderstood. I, I think what it was is that there are certain terms that are staggered. Okay. Um, and so, for example, <clears throat> um, in, let me find it. It was in reference to the staggering of the terms. Yep. So, for example, in the section one under uh, BMC 2.34.030 for membership terms, uh, this is regarding LTAC, positions two, four, and six shall expire in odd number years, positions three, five, and seven expire in even numbered years. And that repeats itself um, also in the Civil Service Commission and other commissions where, and I think Planning Commission as well, where they okay. talk about the, the dates, but I don't recall reading anything. Okay. Where no, was I was reading it. between the lines. Okay. So here's my question, mm -hmm. and it has to have consensus of, of um, council here. Can we do term limits with the caveat that if positions are unfilled, then someone goes past a term limit, you know, say, say we set the term limits at two term limits, mm -hmm. um, with the caveat that if no one applies for it, someone can continue for a third. But I thought if we had term limits, and maybe this is something we want to think about and decide about later, but if we had term limits, that would allow more, in theory, more members of the community to participate on our boards and commissions. So, I don't know of anything under state law that would set term limits or preclude uh, the city from establishing term limits, but it's not something I looked into, so I'd have to get back to you okay. on that. We might not be able to do it. But we might be able to. Correct. Okay, so let's let's talk about that later. And then the other thing is what, that when we talk about shoreline board staff has been really excellent in when we've had a topic that's moved, an, an agenda item that has moved on for discussion, including um, 
uh, comments from people. Can we make sure that when we bring Shoreline that we have uh, the comments that Suzanne Burnell and Ann Agard had, I think she had presented last in April? It would be good to have that when we of revisit. Course. All right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember McNeil. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I just had a, a couple uh, comments around the uh, terms of service. Um, so when I look at um, a three to four year term um, and the opportunities that uh, with, with all those in our community that want to serve and potentially serve, the longer the term I feel, the less opportunity we're giving to members of our community to serve. And I'm just, I want to gauge from a, from a council's perspective is, is increasing the term in one case for the Arts Commission as an example from three to four years. Um, are we doing this to eliminate the work that we have to do to actually appoint these um, committee members? Um, because when I look at that, if, if, if I say that, okay, three to four years, that's an additional year that somebody new, some new voice is not sitting at the table, um, it's a, it potentially could be a lost opportunity. So to me, I look at that as I would rather do the work to ensure that we're allowing as many community members the opportunity to serve and not having such long terms, right? If more people come, give more people opportunity. So if we're not increasing the number of people on the boards and commissions, then how do we get more people involved, especially when we're going three, four, five years down the road? So um, that's just you know a comment that I wanted to make that I, I feel like when we want to be inclusionary and intentional about making sure that we hear as many voices uh, from our community as possible, I feel like this is one area where you know because of the workload we're trying to extend the time of the committee and boards and commissions versus reducing it and having more people come in front of us and, and giving more opportunity. That's just my, my take on it after looking at this. So just wanted to let everybody know how I was feeling about that. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Can you bring up the, the, uh, the last slide with the uh, what's coming next? The one before this. Oh, after this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I assumed, and you know when somebody assumes what that means. <laughs> Uh, because Councilmember McNeil brought up a very good point, and Councilmember, uh, I uh, community engagement, inclusivity, and representation. I thought you're going to be making a. I assume that that includes different ways of including or expanding community engagement, uh, inclusion in the, in the not only in the process but also being involved for longer than the, the more than just an interview. You know. Is that oh, correct? correct. A good yeah, exception? we're going to have. Um, we're, we had a, um, back in I want to say October last year, or maybe prior to that, the previous summer, we did a survey um, of the boards and commissions. But um, yeah, we're going to focus on this summer, like reaching out to the boards and commissions, reaching out to the community to see, you know, so we can bring back some some um, suggestions and how we can do more to include the public. And have a discussion, because we did talk about a youth, for example, a youth thing yeah. last time when we saw this mm -hmm. massive. Yeah, and we can certainly um, look into that as part of, the, as part of that. Because then there's the, the question about the length. I took that as we're just trying to standardize the, the, the periods not to reduce our workload or increase workload or whatever. I, I took it as. You're just making everybody we're, four we're years. We're making it standard, standard because we have some boards that were uh, five-year terms, some three, some four. Um, so we were just trying to standardize it across, you know. But the term, you're still going to have staggered terms, and you're still going to have interviews every year, and people drop off, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So there's still going to be 
Because one good idea also of increasing churn is, and th we can have a study session about it, is because that triggered the inclusivity and representation is, uh, and that's a conversation for September, is having maybe two-year terms for, for folks instead of four years if we want to have some more people involved, especially as we see more folks getting interested in being involved in city government, uh, which is a good thing or maybe different ideas and different ways mm -hmm. of involving them. Maybe not necessarily. It's an idea of the term limit but, or the term length. So um, that's thing. So I was, so my assumption was correct that, that part of that conversation is going to be all of the above what we just talked about. Is that correct? Like having more people, how do we involve, have more people involved, how, if we can add more committees, if we can reduce the length of the period of time, if we, we can do term limits and all these kind of things. Is that going to be a discussion yeah, we'll in September? Take, I'll take this feedback tonight that we okay. heard, and, and yes, we'll make sure that's included in the next study session. But tonight we were asking about the term, for, the, for those three okay. Can you remind us, so can you go back to that slide then, the yeah. action? Robin, can you go back to that slide? Are you trying? Thank you. Sorry. Yep. Oh, you passed it. There you go. Yeah, so we were changing the landmark board from a five-year to a four-year term, and then Arts Commission from three to four years, and Parks Board from three to four years. But the youth positions, we we're recommending that, um, and we, um, to change those to two-year terms, because they turn over a lot, the youth kids. Uh, thank you. I'm good. Councilmember Dodd. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I like the idea of standardizing the terms. I think it makes things a lot clearer to everybody. Um, I think in September, looking at either a different term length or more people on boards makes total sense. But for this tonight, I like it and I plan to vote yes. Thank you. If nobody else has anything to say, I will accept a motion. Councilmember Dodd. I move the recommended action. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Dodd to approve the proposed ordinance as presented and a second from Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Would anybody like to speak to the motion? Councilmember uh, McNeil. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I appreciate the motion and the second. Um, I will not be supporting this uh, motion, not by way of not supporting uh, Council's decision. But just by way of making sure and ensuring that we uh, we hear from as many members of our community as possible, and that we figure out ways to shorten terms so that we can have more participation uh, from members of our community. So, I do support um, members of our community that come forward and want to participate, um, and I think sometimes uh, terms that are uh, four years uh, limit opportunities um, uh, for more members of our community to be engaged. So. I won't be supporting it, but I do support uh, council. Yeah. Um, I can appreciate the intent from council member McNeil on trying to um, make the boards and commissions accessible to more of the com community. Um, and he's brought, brought up some good points. I will support this, but I will also be looking in September for how do we go about encouraging more community involvement and term limits, you know, a balance of term limits seem like a good way to have a balance between what's placed on staff um, and have community involvement. But I'm looking forward to a discussion for doing just what um, uh, my fellow council members have talked about is getting people involved and, and getting a variety of voices engaged. City Clerk. Okay, ready to call for the vote? Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, council Member Zorns? Yes. Mayor Thompson? Yes. Council Member Alderks? Yes. Council Member McNeil? No. Council Member Dodd? Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Yes. Passes five to one with uh, Councilmember McNeil in, in the negative and Councilmember Menke absent and excused. Thank you, City Clerk. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
All right, next up we have Agenda Bill 23067, consideration of a resolution to adopt the 2021 update of the Snohomish County Comprehensive Solid and Hazardous Waste Management Plan. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. And we've been emphasizing a flow of information through study session recently, as you may have observed. I want to call out this um, item tonight and just note that as uh, Emily will explain in further detail, that this is an exception of this will be the first touch for council and we do have a resolution before you. Just something to reinforce is that uh, by taking action tonight, no service will change within the community. Um, any, any changes that come forward as again, Emily will highlight would be, uh, would impact if the city were to annex additional areas within Snohomish County to the community. So again, there's, there's no operational impact of making uh, a decision tonight. Um, and at the same time, if there's more information needed, that's always a great question to ask too. So to walk us through uh, more information and to introduce our colleague from Snohomish County, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Emily Warnock, who's our sustainability and engagement coordinator. Take it away, Emily. Thank you for the introduction and good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Council. Um, as mentioned, I'm here tonight with Snohomish County, who will be sharing a brief overview of the Snohomish County Solid Waste and Hazardous Waste Management Plan with a decision point to adopt the plan that would apply to future annexation areas in Snohomish County. Um, so solid waste is currently managed and will continue to be managed through the King County system. Um, so this doesn't entail service changes for community members. Um, and although the city doesn't currently have plans to annex additional areas of Snohomish County, existing interlocal agreements require us to adopt the plan in case of future um, annexation areas within Snohomish County. Um, I'll pass it over to John to introduce himself. And I apologize to the city clerk, but I'm not able to share the presentation. I'm having a bit of a te technical difficulties here. Well, that, while that uh, presentation is coming up, um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is John Greninger. I'm an operations manager with the Solid Waste Division uh, up in Snohomish County. And uh, the presentation that I'm going to go over tonight is a, uh, a brief. I'm going to go through it fast. <laughs> it's 10 slides um, on um, the Solid and Hazardous Waste Comprehensive Plan. Uh, and And one, uh, one kind of clarification on, I know we, we've been talking about the, the annexation piece. And that is, so Bothell's pretty unique here. And so there's like, we have a separate ILA for solid waste services. And it's kind of a, there's three three-way agreements between us, or city of Bothell, King County, and Snohomish County. And so we're not talking about those interlocal agreements. All, and that's where the annexation pieces are addressed in those interlocal agreements. What I'm gonna ask for tonight is for council to approve a resolution of adoption for the comprehensive plan that the mayor can sign. Um, and then I will take that, uh, that resolution and package it up into, um, uh, to the Department of Ecology. So that's, that's kind of the, the ask. And so the resolution of adoption and the interlocal agreements are kind of two different things, um, but related. So, yeah. All right, perfect. Um, so we're having us so, controlling the slides, but if you'd like to Oh, we're not, we're not, oh, so you're gonna control the slides? Perfect, thank you. So uh, what I'm gonna kind of go over just real quick is the, the timeline of the update process and kind of what we went through to do this, um, a general overview of the plan elements. And there's basically three parts to it. There's a volume one, volume two, and the appendices. I want to give you kind of the next steps of what we're doing with the comp plan and just some general solid waste updates. So the timeline on this, we started right at the beginning of 2020. Anything else we know that started right around 2020? Um, it has been a slog, right? 
um, doing this, like with, with all of our activities. And it's nice now we're um, able to meet in person. We're getting all of our committee uh, uh, meetings back in person. Um, so we've been through three grant administrators at the Department of Ecology. We've been through three solid waste directors in the solid waste division. Uh, we've been through our SWAC, our Solid Waste Advisory Committee, has changed more than half of the members. It's been a grind. And so um, I'm excited to continue this, uh, this process. So the top part that's been completed, we, we started in 2020. We went through multiple SWAC meetings, ecology review, public comment, took those comments and got endorsement from SWAC and did the SEPA review. And so for the last little bit, I've been going to all the cities for their resolution of adoptions for the plan. Um, last month, uh, County Council just finished, um, they did their resolution of adoption of the plan. Uh, and so once I uh, can get the city of Bothell's resolution, I will get, I got one more SWAC review, which is a SWAC meeting next week. And then uh, I can package that all up and get it to the Department of Ecology for their final review. Uh, next slide. So just to kind of highlight some of the public outreach that we've done, we uh, had a, a multi-month process where we, um, we did uh, outreach via social media, websites. We distributed uh, uh, copies of the plan to all the Snow Isle libraries. Uh, we had multiple SWAC meetings, which I'm going to have an ask for, I don't know if that's going to be you or not, um, for a SWAC member uh, from the city of Bothell, because currently we don't have, uh, we don't have one. Um, and then I've done multiple presentations for uh, city councils um, throughout the county. So a general high level overview of the, of the plan, and this is the first section, it's kind of like an expanded executive summary. Um, and really it's, the plan provides for a framework for solid waste activities in Snohomish County. And it really has a focus uh, for this, this plan, that kind of the flavor of it is um, emphasize more local, state, and federal coordination, right? And coordinating with our contracted partners and um, the SWAC, our Solid Waste Advisory Committee, has been um, not great. I mean, not just because of COVID, but it hasn't been real great the last few years um, just because we've been ironing out um, some of the logistics on the, well, you guys were just talking about boards and commissions, right? And so we've been having to deal with some boards and commission items. And so we got those kind of tuned up. And so we're really looking for an emphasis, uh, emphasis on SWAC, um, the SWAC committee. We're also going to define priorities for the division. We're going to relook at our um, kind of mission statements, goals, strategic plan, and we're always looking for continuous improvement opportunities. So that's the first part. Uh, volume one is just a summary of the current system, and it's a review of what's changed since the last plan, right? And then it provides kind of a vision of the future with the two main goals really being uh, to reduce climate change, climate change impacts and promote sustainability initiatives. And then the second goal is really to just continue to provide efficient services for uh, solid waste issues. Volume two, now this is the meat of the, of the plan. And on the slide, um, so we call these all technical memorandums. They're, they're individual chapters that really get into the weeds on some of these specific items. And so on the left, it follows kind of the, um, kind of the path of solid waste, I guess, from um, just in general climate change and sustainability all the way through like recycling, organics, and then the waste, like creating the waste and then the transfer and disposal. So it's kind of the path. Within each technical memorandum of, um, of the plan on the right, that reviews the summary background and the existing programs, planning issues, and each chapter has recommendations and alternatives associated with it. And so the idea there is 
those chapters on those specific topics will kind of guide activities for, um, for the solid waste division and the community. Next slide. The third part of the plan is the appendices. The Department of Ecology requires lots of background information in there. And so a lot of these are kind of mandated uh, items. Uh, we roll our, um, our uh, MRW, the Moderate Risk Waste Plan, into uh, the, the overall comp plan. A lot of jurisdictions keep it separate. Uh, the big thing here is the, um, uh, the Contamination Reduction Outreach Plan. That was a, that was a, new, uh, a new law that uh, Ecology brought into I think that was a that was a twenty that was a twenty twenty law, and so we have it in there, um, and we're going to be trying to implement that one. So that's kind of a new one, and then the resolutions of adoptions are all in uh, Appendix I of the of the plan. So the next steps would be that I ask that you approve a resolution of adoption for the mayor to sign. Um, and then I will do next week as um, we have a SWAC meeting, and so we'll do one final review of the waste and recycling elements of uh, of the plan. I'll package it up, submit it to the Department of Ecology, and then the idea here is to uh, have it be a bit more dynamic and usable uh, framework. Because when I when I started this in uh, um, in 2020, we were moving our facilities and I came across this box and it was the 2004 comp plan in the box all printed not even cracked open right I mean that's that's, that's kind of crazy um, and so I really see this as a dynamic plan that we can there, there's lots of items on recycling organics waste coming up right um, that we can just use this as a, a framework and and once it's approved, then we can just start dynamically uh, keeping it consistent and uh, updated. Next slide. So just some uh, just general updates here. Uh, Dave Schoenhart, he's our solid waste director. He's been there um, a year and a bit, year and a couple months now. That's his contact info there. Um, if you ever have any questions about the, the you know, solid waste in Snohomish County, I already kind of touched on SWAC representation. Um, since we do have uh, the ILA with uh, the City of Bothell for solid waste services, um, and even though half of that's going south to King County, uh, there's still a spot on the SWAC board for a, because um, you, have, you have a voting spot, right? And so I would ask that uh, the, the city look for a, a SWAC member uh, to sit on that uh, board um, and so that'd be great You'd get more uh, get more feedback and then there's my contact info um, or you can uh, contact Emily or Aaron or and get a hold of me uh, so that's uh, that's kind of my quick presentation if there's any questions I'll be glad to answer any of those mm -hmm. If nobody has any questions, I will accept a motion. Councilmember Altrick's question. I do have a, a couple questions. Um, so when you are asking for representation to the to SWAC committee, um, is that from staff or is that from council? It's from however. Or the, our community. Is, I'm, it, it can be any of those. We actually no. have, um, so on SWAC, there's. And count, um, I'm going to step in, John. I'm sorry, but we can we can follow up with more information on that. I think with okay. not having that be a decision that's before council tonight, I think we should probably get some more information and tee that up for a deeper discussion before we dive into what it would look like and take a look at all of our representation, including in King County as well. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then the other question is, um, so is it because Bothell's has a section of our city that is in Snohomish County that we are included in the Snohomish County plan? Yes. And I realize that's a very rudimentary question, but. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say about half, you know, the north half of the city of Bothell is mm -hmm. in Snohomish County. 
So it's it split evenly, but in 2011, there was a series of agreements where um, it was decided, I, I think procedurally, because it, it's, I, I can understand how it's difficult to, okay, you got the county boundary, south of that arbitrary boundary, right, it has to go to the King County system and north it has to go, it, it procedurally, there's, there's a lot of logistics there, right? Yeah, so in 2011, um, those agreements were put into place. It's a 50-year agreement. It goes to the year, I think it's, uh, I think it's 2057, something like that, that uh, that the agreement goes to. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the design. And and earlier there was the discussion about the annexations because there's there's a little island that we're kind of talking about. Um, I've reached out to King County on that, and I'm waiting for um, them to return my emails on uh, what that kind of adjustment might look like. But yeah, it's it's kind of odd, but that's what it is. Well, I appreciate the clarity, and thanks for being here to present this to us tonight. Yeah. So just to clarify, if we were to annex that little island, the 50-year agreement would would hold in place for that annexation with King County? We're uh, talking about the Bloomberg uh, Island annexation? Sure, yeah. The so, unincorporated part of uh, Snohomish County that could possibly be annexed oh, okay. to, into Bothell. So I, I think, so, so we were talking about a specific situation that, as, that is in play right now. So let me address your question. If, and, and actually, if, and John, our council hasn't been engaged, no. and this is a staff discussion. I think Emily might have a better, a more applicable response. Yeah, okay. to jump in now, the intent in um, adopting the Snohomish County Comp Plan is for future annexations further into Snohomish County, which we don't currently have any planned, and we plan to continue managing solid waste within city limits through King County system. Uh, okay, so then my second question, just it's a hypothetical question. So for the portion of our city that is in Snohomish County, we have till 2057 where a new agreement would have to go into place, and theoretically we could say the Snohomish County part of solid waste of Bothell could you include that in your comp plan and giving them, you know, what service would look like for them and what, what your goals and objectives are? But really that conversation is not in, in sight lines until 2057. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. I think I got a handle. Thank you. Councilor McNeil. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is very confusing to me. But um, I guess I want to just make sure that I clarify some stuff. So the community doesn't need to necessarily understand what these agreements are, just that they're getting the service provided to them, correct? So can, can, you, can you speak to that? Because when we talk through a lot of this, annexations and all these different variables that happen in ILAs, um, the most important thing for the community is the, the level of service that we're providing them. And so if you could just speak to that, what, obviously this is doing some portion of that, correct? Well, not the resolution of adoption. Mm -hmm. And the, in the comp plan are all the interlocal agreements that we have with Bothell and all the other cities and towns in Sonomish County. So those, those are part of it there. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's to provide efficient services for um, all the residents of Sonomish County, including the city of Bothell residents. And so by that interlocal agreement that we have, that's the idea is as of that 2011 boundary, all those services are going to go south to King County. And it allows us to have a free boundary. Yeah. Basically is what yeah. we're doing. We're, provide, we're provide, able to provide a level of service to Snohomish County with a partnership with King County as well. Correct. Is, is that what I'm understanding? That, that, that okay, is, I, I just wanted to get that out there because that that's what I know is happening. But I want to make sure that as we have this conversation, the community understands yep, that as well. Because if you, if you, yep, exactly. If you live in this in the city on the Snohomish County side, your garbage collection will be the same. If you were on the King County side, it's just and that's just logistically where 
it's going to flow is to the south to the King County system. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. This is, uh, I was confused as well, but thank you for clarifying. Um, the question I have is, uh, has, uh, I'm assuming, but then again, you know what that means, um, that staff, city staff has reviewed the, this, this plan and signed off on it and it's ready to go. We just need to approve it then? Is like, yes, that's correct. Yeah. And it's, how is this going to affect, there's no effect on ILAs, right? Like, like they're all the same. So what, what are we adopting? This is still, I'm still, if, the, if the contracts are written, yep. what are we approving? The plan. Which is? The, the, the resolution of adoption. Of the comp plan for Snohomish County. For, for this part of the Snohomish County. Correct. That's, that is, um, there are two distinct parts to getting a plan approved, is you have to have the ILAs, which at this point they're not changing. Right? And you have to have a resolution of adoption from all the cities and towns. And th those are the two pieces that, in conjunction with the plan, that I have to submit that whole package to ecology. Yeah, so the ILAs aren't changing. Uh, there may be, if we have to do some, well, you'll get into that later. Um, there may be some later changes to the ILA. But right now, it's that's not changing, and the resolution of adoption is what I need to order in order to submit the plan to the Department mm. of Ecology. Because we haven't seen the the actual details, except for the summary, the you know the the headlines that you just showed us there. But I'm assuming that staff has reviewed and approved all the details in there, and they're okay with it for the plan. For the plan, the yes. Well, for the well, city council is going to approve something that we haven't seen. So, <laughs> the details of which we haven't seen. All we've seen is this contract. Uh, there's this uh, presentation. So I just want to make sure that. Yes, staff have reviewed the plan, um, and we should have had a link included in the council ed packet as well. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Dodd. I just want to clarify, for my understanding and for everybody, we have to approve this because we are a Snohomish County city. But in practice, unless we annex another part within Snohomish County, it doesn't mean anything to residents of Bothell because it does not apply to us because we have an interlocal agreement and our waste is all managed the same. So we have to approve it for you to file your plan, but it doesn't actually do anything. So that's I, I feel like everyone, like there's a level of concern that I think is just it's kind of like a checklist item, basically, right, for you? Ab absolutely. Okay. In, in, in the ILAs, there's a, a piece in there that talks about um, Bothell participation in the SWAC, right, and um, participation with the, the comp plan, right? And so this, this is the participa participation in the comp plan piece. But it is a just, it's just a checklist, a procedural item that... Um, that, that we need to continue. Uh, but it's not gonna change any of the solid waste services. Uh, and going forward, if we get the SWAC representation, then there'll be more City of Bothell involvement in that portion of the, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee with the county. Yeah, and I like that. I actually, um, my other council member who lives in the Snohomish County part of the city is not here tonight, but I do. And even though our, our waste goes through the King County system, we still use, like, the, I use the Mount Lake Terrace transfer station when I go through my cleaning phases and all that stuff. So totally get it. Um, I just yeah. wanted to make sure we were all on the same page that the impact is not immediate, but that you need our sign-off to file your overall comprehensive plan. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record... I don't, I usually at work in my day job, I don't sign contracts without actually looking at them. So, yeah. And I realized that there's, it was linked and I tried to browse through it, but I'm not an expert. You know, my day job, come ask me any questions, I'll give you all the answers. But this, so that's why I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page, that staff is good with it. And I trust our city staff uh, and I'll be good with this. Just wanted to make sure that, put that out there. Understood, thank you. I have no questions, but I will accept a motion. Can I make one final comment? Go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Thank you for pointing us to the link in our packet. Um, a quick search of just the word Bothell um, reiterates what we're hearing tonight is that Bothell has um, an agreement with King County or with Recology for all of our um, waste to go to King County and that's part of the plan. So we're basically approving the plan that we're gonna keep our level of service that we have. Is that one way to put it? Cool. Nothing's changing. All right. That's hope. I, I hope that is helpful. Sure. And I will make a motion motion to approve the recommended action. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Aldrichs and a second from Council Member Dodd to approve the proposed resolution adopting the 2021 update of the Snohomish County Comprehensive Solid and Hazardous Waste Management Plan. Would anybody like to speak to the motion? Seeing none, City Clerk. I say yes or no when I call your name. Councilmember Zorn. Yes. Mayor Thompson. Yes. Councilmember Aldrichs. Yes. Councilmember McNeil. Yes. Councilmember Dodd. Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Yes. Passes 6 0 with Councilmember Mankey after an excused. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we've got Agenda Bill 23068, the Regional Crisis Response Principles Assembly Appointment. I'm going to call on City Manager Stannert to introduce the presenter, City Manager Stannert. That's right. It's a complicated system. <laughs> we will talk about appointment of positions uh, now. As Council knows, last fall you uh, were presented with an uh, interlocal agreement to form the Regional Crisis Response Agency known as the acronym RACER. And uh, so the, the organization was, was formed and initiated on January 1st. Uh, the executive board has been meeting. One of the primary actions was to hire an executive director, which took place in, in April and, or in March. And Brooke Butner from formerly of RADAR was hired. Uh, as the agency continues to form, I'm happy to report to that the transfer of staff from from Bothell to this new agency is also scheduled to take place on June 1st, so things are going well and really grateful for the work that, that Brooke and her team now that's assembled are putting together. One of the pieces that is yet to, to come is that you'll see in your agenda bill there is a organization chart of how this multi-agency cooperative is organized and one of the, the pieces in there is to have a principal's assembly. Again, for those who may not be as familiar who are watching at home, as Bothell being one of the cities that's a member of this, we are considered a principal agency. Uh, per the ILA, uh, the current agencies who joined at the beginning will be the principal cities uh, for at least a year of operations. And at that time, any other locality that shares a border with an existing uh, agency is able to join. Um, with that said, the first principal's assembly is scheduled to take place on June 28th. That's still a tentative schedule because as we are having this discussion, several other cities are also appointing who their representative would be. Per the ILA, each principal agency, so each city in this case, would select one council member to serve as the primary representative. Per our norm in Bothell, it would also be open to the idea of selecting a, a um, an alternate uh, in case certain dates don't work. The commitment level is outlined in the agenda bill and also found in the directly quoted from the interlocal agreement. The, um, the, the principal's assembly after the first biennium will most likely meet once a year unless the council from one of the principal cities calls for a meeting to take place, that can be that can be done as well. But in this first biennium, the uh, anticipation is to have three meetings a year, and again with the first meeting in June. Um, with that, we're planning on following what's outlined in Section 2.08, Section G of the City Council Protocol Manual, of how you appoint representatives to external committees or committee assignments. Uh, in which case, uh, we'd be looking for concurrence of council on who to appoint. Uh, this then, uh, for, the, for this position, the term would last until next January, which is our next regularly scheduled time to review all of the committee assignments for the council, and we'd pick it back up then. So with that, I'll pause and be happy to respond to any questions. Councilmember Dodd? We can nominate people, right? That's an option. Sure. 
Okay, I would like to nominate Councilmember Alders. This is very much in her wheelhouse and she's done a great job on similar task forces. I believe it's within the decorum to say I accept the nomination. <laughs> I, I do appreciate the thought, thank you. I don't know if nominations require a second, but I would do that. I don't think anybody's as qualified to do that as Councilmember Alders here. You're saying no, so I withdraw my second. <laughs> it can be an unofficial second. Okay. Did, is there any reason to continue this discussion or should we just appoint Councilmember Alderks? I'm not seeing anybody else. I would raise also their hand request an alternate, like if there's another name that could come forward. Um, and this has not been discussed beforehand, so I don't, I don't know who I'm volunteering. Well, I'm, I'm just volunteering people. I'm sorry. Um, but if uh, Councilmember McNeil or uh, Deputy Mayor Alcabra were interested um, to be my alternate, I would appreciate it. I would also like to suggest um, Councilmember Dodd as an alternate. Hold on. I, in that case, I think I should suggest Councilmember Zorns just to make this super awkward <laughs> since we haven't gotten involved in this yet. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to um, also agree with Dodd. I think uh, Councilmember Dodd would, would make it amazing. Councilmember Dodd, how do you feel about that? I, I'm, I'm for it. I thank you. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to step on the deputy mayor's toes. Oh. I'm just here so I won't get fined. Okay. okay. <laughs> Do, do we vote now, or? <laughs> I don't think we have to vote. <laughs> it, there seems to be a clear consensus that the representative would be Councilmember Alder Alderks with the um, alternate being Councilmember Dodd. If there's opposition, we could hear it, but otherwise it seems by acclamation that's been accepted. Perfect. All right, thank, thank you. you. City Clerk will note that in the roster. All right, we are going to take a break now um, to set up for the study session here in the council chambers. It is 7.08. We will come back at 7.20. All right. Are we? Yes, on air, we are reconvening the meeting. Um, first up is Agenda Bill 23069. Study session on the consideration of resolution to submit the renewal of urban district emergency medical service levy to voters in Snohomish County. City Manager. Thanks, Mayor. And again, welcome everybody to a, we're trying a slightly different format in a different room. So hopefully, hopefully it works well. We have three study sessions before you tonight. A good opportunity to, to learn about some new information. And first up, our finance director, Kwan Wong, is here to present a study session with the consideration of a resolution to submit the renewal of an urban district emergency medical service EMS levy to voters in Snohomish County. Kwan will uh, touch on the, on the details of this, and I would just really emphasize, too, that this would be a renewal. This is not a, a new levy, and Kwan will walk you through what that looks like. Take it away. Thank you, city manager. Um, good evening, mayor, uh, council members. Um, so we are in front of you seeking feedback uh, tonight on a uh, potential resolution before you uh, schedule uh, next month uh, to renew the Snohomish County uh, Emergency Medical Services Levy. And again, as uh, Kyle said, this is a renewal. This is not a new uh, levy. We have done this in the past uh, many years. So um, we're here to answer questions uh, that you have. Uh, with me uh, on Zoom is Ted, our Deputy uh, Finance Director, and also our uh, City Bank Council, uh, Alice. Uh, I, I hope she's online soon. But anyway, uh, let me kick off. Um, uh, the study session with uh, an overview. So the current six-year uh, Snohomish County EMS levy passed by the voters back in 2017 will expire on January 1st, 2024. So this is uh, timely that we come before you asking for feedback. And again, um, on June 13th, I uh, will come before you uh, with a resolution for you to adopt. 
the rate uh, in the current levy that we passed uh, was 33.5 cents per 1,000 uh, uh, assessed value. So a new uh, six-year levy uh, starting in 2024 uh, to 2029 uh, would need voters' approval to continue both the basic uh, life support and uh, the advanced life support services in the Snohomish County area of Bothell. So a vote of the resolution is scheduled again uh, before the council uh, on June 13th. Uh, we do have some uh, deadline later on, I will yeah, point out uh, that we have to file uh, the uh, ballot uh, with the Snohomish County Auditor uh, on, before uh, August 1st uh, this year. So the next slide, uh, so this is uh, staff's recommendation uh, for your consideration. So you can ask us your questions between now and uh, June. Um, so the proposed uh, six year EMS levy that uh, staff is recommending uh, will be a 26.5 cents uh, per $1,000 assessed value. And again, this is a lower rate uh, than the one we passed uh, almost six years ago. Uh, so this is a lower rate. Um, but the purpose is not about uh, whether we adopt a different rate. It's really in part with uh, what King County is paying uh, or the King County residents paying. So what we're recommending to you is just you know, be in par with uh, King County's rate. So this will let uh, Snohomish and King County residents of the city pay the same levy rate for sharing the cost of providing uh, EMS within the city. Uh, this rate will yield an estimated $2.18 million annually uh, based on 2023 assessed value for the Snohomish County side of Bothell. Uh, so the amount is approximately $535,000 more than in the adopted uh, 2024 budget. Uh, so I can explain that later. Um, so again, uh, it's not about the revenue, uh, the, the policy choices uh, to have the rate in practice uh, with uh, what we have done in the past. So we have some uh, timeline before you uh, as the next steps. Uh, on June 13th uh, this year, we will uh, ask the council to adopt the resolution. Uh, based on uh, uh, council's uh, uh, advice, um, uh, so there is no statutory uh, requirement to conduct a public hearing on the levy. Uh, so, but it's a choice, uh, but there is no statutory uh, requirement. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, August 1st, uh, 2023, will be the filing deadline uh, with the Snohomish auditor uh, for the levy to put on the November 7th election. So uh, this is really uh, an overview, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, and Ted is online, and so I think is Alice. So Alice uh, Ostrick uh, is our bond counsel. Will this result in a tax increase for Snohomish County residents? Uh, so no, uh, it is just based on the assessed value, and we are kept at uh, uh, a certain rate. Perfect. So this, so so Snohomish County residents, since this is a renewal of a levy, they won't see their property taxes go up because of this. Correct. Perfect. Um, that and the fact that this is something that the community has already voted for and already told us they want, I am not going to tell them they can't have it. Okay, oh, 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 that's true. Um, just a quick comment. I'm going to state the obvious. We are not required to have public comment, but for any of the public who's listening and wants to let council know how they feel about it, they should let us know. Uh, that's correct, yeah. but there is no required uh, right. to hold a public hearing for right. the levy alone. Right. Yeah, but okay. the action itself, uh, uh, we are uh, having public uh, right hearings as well. Yeah, and I, that's what I would want to clarify. I think you, that's what you meant was a right. public hearing. Um, public comment, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Emails, letters, any way of communicating with the council before your vote, absolutely. Right. Um, Kwan is pointing out that there isn't a public hearing required, right. but to make sure that council knows whether or not you want one. But public comment, 
Absolutely. Right. No, I just wanted to make sure the public knows that their comments are, are welcome Alice if has, they wanted um, to make comments. Her hand up. So, Alice, do you have any comment? I would just also clarify it's, it, there's no public hearing requirement in the statute about putting the levy on the ballot. And when it comes time to actually adopt the levy for next year, when you're doing all of your city levies and this levy, then of course, all of the regular um, you know, public hearing requirements there in terms of actually levying the tax. So as to the ballot measure, there's no uh, public hearing requirement, but you know, again, of course, it's part of the public process. Well, and it's, it's also a ballot measure, so we all right. get to vote. I know that in the scheme of things, when people look at their property tax, they're not going to look at it and go, wow, look how much my property tax has gone down. But I hope they can feel a little bit of relief with this if, if this, and I'm hoping and anticipating that it will pass, but I, I do hope that people will see a little bit of relief. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> so... Um, the level of service is the same in King and Snohomish County, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay, and this so is... the decrease is to level the assessed, the the fee per 1,000, is that correct, to match King County's? That's correct. Okay. We received the same service uh, provided by um, our, our uh, contractor. Gotcha. So the, there's no difference in the level of service, the EMS service in Snohomish versus King County. That's correct. Okay. So some. So obviously the community supports this, but it, just want to raise, you know, where where I see is the assessed values of King County the same as the assessed values of Snohomish County, meaning if you live in King County, and you're assessed at one rate, right? Your house your house value mm -hmm. is one thing versus Snohomish County, it could be slightly different, correct? So you could live in the same square foot home, but your value of your home in King County might be worth more than the value of your home in Snohomish County. So you're paying more for the levy because of the assessed value of your home. Correct. The rate is the same across the board. Yeah. Yeah. You're just paying more for that, correct? I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding Co that. Correct, and what, what Quan is yep. saying, it, yeah, the assessed, the, the the assessed value will be different in different parts of the community and different houses, absolutely. The rate is the parity that, that we're aiming for, which has been the council's practice, I believe, mm -hmm. when we researched this. That's been the historic practice of the council is to shoot for parity of the rate between the two counties. Right, and so with the increased assessed value um, this year on most homes in King and Snohomish County, um, the decrease is actually a little bit of help. Am I understanding that correctly? Because you're, if your assessed value increases, but you reduce the rate slightly, mm -hmm. and again, we're talking a very small portion of right. all of the taxation that happens on your property taxes. But I just want to make sure that we at least have the conversation around that, that your assessed value for your home this year has increased, in some cases, two and three times. And therefore, it may seem like we're reducing, but in, inevitably, it's not reducing your taxes because your assessed value has gone up exponentially, right? So I just want to make sure that, you know, as we're, these are some of the comments that I'm hearing from the community, and, and obviously the community is going to be the ultimate decider on mm -hmm. this, but I want to make sure um, when we're having conversations around taxation that we're having the conversation around how the assessed values are affecting people today because I'm hearing it from the community that their home values have gone up so much that all of the taxes that have been placed on them is hurting them now. So I'm not saying this one will, mm -hmm. and they're voting for these taxes, but I want to at least have the conversation. So um, the, other, the other question I had was around um, when you say uh, King and Snohomish County, the contract, it for service, what, what is? Uh, and mm, city manager, do you yeah. have the more have the detailed information about the? Um, yeah, so how it's currently working for, for Bothell and the service that we have is that, um, again, with King County, that's Medic One, we hear about it all over the country. And um, so in our uh, first, in Snohomish County, 
the city does contract for our advanced life support or ALS services with Shoreline Fire District. Um, and so that they are a King County Medic One provider. So that it's the it's like for like same service. That contract for providing the King County paramedic service for Snohomish County is then covered with that. So it, it truly is um, the same the same service level that's being provided throughout the community that way. Yeah, that I just wanted to make sure I was clear on that because it mm -hmm. seems like we know no no boundaries, right? There's no border here, so I wanted to make sure. The folks in Snohomish County are getting the same level of service from the same provider that if you live in King County, you're getting in Snohomish County. And it's absolutely a great question because we would, mm -hmm. you know, you'd hate to think that, like for me as a Snohomish County Bothell resident, that I would have anything different if I had an incident at work versus at home, right? That That's not a scenario that we would ask the public to make a choice on. And so you're absolutely right. That parity is really what we're aiming for as much as we can in this situation. Thank you. Is this like other levies that we have going where when uh, new people move into new housing, it reduces the share for everybody else? Do we change the rate on an annual basis depending on housing units? It, it depends on the value and rather than uh, yeah. the number of people. I believe the rate stays consistent. It's a rate. Okay. rate. It, but as, as housing process or prices go up and down, then that would be we would see some fluctuation there. But yeah, for the for the length of the of the measure, the the rate would be consistent. Okay, that's good. So my understanding of the the changes in property values over time mm -hmm. is that um, throughout the city of Bothell, um, house values are much higher in 2023 than they were in 2017. Um, I, I don't know what the number, I don't know what the median home value in 2017 was off the top of my head. Um, and if somebody does, I'm impressed, but, <laughs> um, I think Ted may have some information. Um, uh, Ted, do you have anything ready? If not, uh, we will Alice's come back to you. Hand up too. Maybe Alice wants to weigh in. I'll, I'll come back to mine. Um, go ahead, Ted, if you have information that you wanted to share there. Unmute, you're on mute, I believe. Now you're muted. And um, we can't hear you. Yeah, switch your audio settings to your microphone. Like it's in the little, next to the mute, unmute thing, there's a little arrow. I, I found it online in the in a document center at bothellwa.gov. It says in 2017, the median home value was $414,200. How's that? Okay. That's better. Yes. Much better. No, I don't have any information off the top of my head on media. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one I always turn to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I realize it's a rather obscure factoid to ask you to recall. Uh, um, but it looks like the mayor was able to find it on the website. And, um, and so property values have significantly increased. So the fact that a, a life-saving public service that we all rely on and, and want to make sure is there when we need it um, is actually decreasing in in the base cost in terms of the rate that we're paying on our assessed value is very nice. And I'm speaking on behalf of, of um, Snohomish County residents because I do not live in Snohomish County. Um, but that it is, it's nice to see that that is sometimes possible um, because there is some relief there given the fact that home values have, in some cases, more than doubled. Um, and and what if I understand this correctly, every year homes are assessed, um, reassessed for a new value, and that's how our property taxes are calculated. So over the last six years, um, residents would have seen a steady increase. The rate stays the same, but a steady increase in the value of their home, which then correlates to a slightly higher payment towards these services. Um, and it's not like we're going from a 2017 cost and then six years later it's ballooned. Mm -hmm. It has actually slowly increased over time so that we would see probably, you know, house prices continue to go up another slight increase, um, because our property values are higher. Um, and, and I realize that that's a very rudimentary understanding of how property taxes work, but, um, sometimes it can be helpful to just 
he, have it be reviewed how, you know, that these services continue to provide us services like that we really need. <laughs> um, and, and that the prices do change and fluctuate over time, but in a way that is, um, is fair and incremental um, for our community members. We don't have control over the market more than any, like we have very little control over that, but, um, but when it comes to the public process, we do have control over what our rates are and how property values is assessed. And this is an opportunity for the voters to vote on you know, whether they need life-saving services or not. Just a comment. Ted, did you have something to add? Uh, I would just add that when the levy is set, let's, and then over the six year life of the levy, the amount that we actually collect is limited to a 1% increase every year if the council chooses to take that, plus an allowance for the value of any new construction that gets added to the tax rolls. So part of this is also a resetting in terms of every six years you get a chance to reset because you only get that 1% increase every year. So I'm anticipating a question about why it, why would it be $500,000 more and if I may, that that was sort of there seemed to be a bunch of questions about just sort of property tax basics here that, you know, maybe I thought I could help um, chime in on there. Um, so I think a lot of what's been said is absolutely correct that the um, the rate that's selected here would be the maximum rate. Um, that could be imposed and how much you pay depends on the assessed value of your particular house and how fast that value increases or decreases over time. But the rate, the idea here in selecting the rate for the Snohomish County portion of the city is to, again, keep the rate the same as what those, the King County uh, residents of the city pay. So that everybody at least is on that same rate basis. And then the amount you pay will be different than your neighbors based on the assessed value of your house compared to your neighbors. Whether they live in the same county or you as or not shouldn't make that much of a difference. So, um, so that, again, you know, that's what everyone has been saying. The idea here is just to come up with a, a system where both residents of both counties are paying the same rates. Um, and then the second point, I think, which Ted just made was that um, the maximum rate for the six year period will be set by this ballot measure. Um, and then whatever um, amount uh, actually gets collected or gets imposed um, will form a cap that can only increase by that 1% levy lid that applies to all of the city's levies um, other than um, anything that's a voted bond levy. Um, but for this, it's just like your, your regular levies. It's within the 101% cap, so it can only increase by that 1% each year. Um, and again, if assessed values go up rapidly, then you do see the rates go down um, over time and people do still then pay approximately the same amount from year to year. And that's the intent behind the 101% levy lid. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and if there are other questions on the technical details of how the property taxes work, I'm also happy to dive into those for you. Yeah, so just a clarifying question. So if if the valuation of all the properties that would be paying on this levy increase 30% over the course of a year, then the amount that those properties would pay for this levy would decrease by that same 30% so that they're not paying 30% more. Um, Is that correct? Not the, not the amount, but the rate. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know that 30, I don't know that it would translate exactly the same as 30%, but yes, as assessed values go up, rates come down and what stays constant in the middle um, is essentially to produce that same collection amount. So if the city wants $2.5 million um, and you kind of, that's the steady point, um, as assessed values go up, rates will come down. If assessed values were to fall, the rate would go back up, but people would be paying approximately the same amount from year to year in terms of real dollars. Okay, on the on this levy, is that correct? Yep. Okay, so that, that would apply to all levies that are similar to this one? That's true, yes. Okay, 
Um, and then I just wanted to, uh, Council Member Aldrich brought up a great point, and I think the mayor brought up um, some valuations that have increased from 2017 to current. Um, and the thing that, that, that I'm hearing a lot right now is about the fact that, that some folks had bought their homes in 2008, 9, 10, 17, um, their properties have increased in value. And their property taxes, which they just received recently, have increased tenfold. And so some of the folks that are on fixed incomes in our community are reaching out and saying, wait a minute, I, I can no longer afford my property taxes, and I bought because I wanted to raise my family here. And so if you take a home that's $400,000 in 2017, and you think about its valuation today at a million dollars, could the person who bought that home for 400000 find another home if they're still on the same income? Because not everybody gets a cost of inflation raise every single year, right? So I want to make sure that when we think about and talk about these things, we're, we're thinking about those who, who actually bought and um, seniors in our community that potentially are, are facing those higher taxations. And when we say that those seniors can go and get, you know, discounts and, and apply for these things, for some seniors that have disabilities and things like that, it's not that easy for them to do especially when they're living on their own. So I want to make sure that we're consciously thinking about all these things. Again, ultimately, this decision that we're talking about tonight will be in the hands of the community um, where it should be. But I want to make sure that we at least are having these conversations because taxes are affecting a lot of people in our community. And, and I don't know about all of you, but I'm hearing from the community about it. So just wanted to make sure that uh, during this conversation, when it comes to taxes, that we, we have these same conversations as well. Thank you. No, I really appreciate that point. It's very important. I did want to ask um, city manager, my grandparents lived in the city of Seattle and when they qualified for tax exemptions, there was a person at the city of Seattle who helped them apply. Do we have that program either through the city or through a human services provider? Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look into that and get back to you in terms of if we have and a some partnership. library systems do too. Like mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of different programs. So I would want to make sure we have something like that to so guide people through that. I believe this came up in, in the fall when we were talking about budget. And I, I believe that we do have a partnership that does, or we have some program of it, but I want to make sure we follow up with accurate information so we can, we can get back to you. Yeah. And I did want to add one detail. It's minor, but it is important when we talk about levies. The median home price is not the median assessed value price. So my, my assessed home price has gone up since I bought in 2018, but it still doesn't match what I could sell the house for. And I think it may be after five years caught up to what I paid for the house. So different numbers just as we talk about things and visualize in our heads. Um, Ted reminded us, and I know uh, finance director, you, there's a $500,000 value there that, can you explain that, that I didn't see before? So if we collect at the uh, 26 point uh, five cents as proposed, uh, so we have an estimated uh, increase in about $500,000 over our budget. In our budget estimate, uh, we were just you know, assuming uh, a certain rate but now we have a, um, uh, a proposed rate uh, before you. So we do, just want to identify the $500,000 uh, so-called in, uh, in so-called um, extra uh, amount in our budget. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the amount will also go to uh, pay for anticipated uh, increases in, in costs. Yeah, that was, the, so, I think, the point, the port to remember too, it's compared to what was adopted last, last fall. Um, and so we can, again, that's within our biennial budget, which every every year we get to take a look at, and there will be other costs that go up. So while that's against the budgeted amount, I'm sure three years from now that'll look like a different number, but in the interim, those are conversations we I can have at the mid buy. I don't understand, that's a revenue value, or is that a cost value? Like, I don't understand. That's a revenue value. So why did we not, uh... If, if according to Alice, and I see her hand raised, we <laughs> said we have a certain budget that we budgeted for, but then we want to collect $2 million a year. Rates will go up and down, doesn't matter, houses will go up and down, we're just going to get approximately $2, $2 million a year. Why would we get extra? So I think where this is, uh, where this uh, difference is coming from, remember this is all based on estimates of what the assessed values will be in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're, you're, so if you were to take the 26 and a half cents that's in the proposal and use mm -hmm. that as your levy rate mm -hmm. and multiply it, I'm not sure, Quan, if you used 
your estimate of what 2024 assessed values are, then you're estimating that that levy would produce a little more than what you had budgeted for this year. So, you know, we're kind of talking future projections, but right. I think the point is that the 26 and a half cents will be large enough to collect the amount of money that you had budgeted for this year, understanding that your 2024 levy, you don't yet know what the real assessed value is and you haven't yet, um, you know, budgeted for 2024. And, you know, so you don't quite know at this point what those, what your budget amounts would be, but if you kind of, proceeded on the same path as you had been in the last couple of years, that dot, that levy rate should be sufficient to cover what you have historically budgeted for that. I think that's a, a way to summarize it. Right. Ted's still got his uh, hand Ted, up there. you have your hands up. I would just, I, I would also add that you're setting this rate every six years. And so and then, it, and again, you can only increase it by that 1% a year and costs are more than likely going up by more than that 1% a year. So it's important to take that opportunity when you renew the levy to reset. Okay, so you're just- And the other, and the other, and the other point I would make is that, again, this is, the aim here is to tie to what the King County residents will be paying as far as when King County resets their levy. So again, the, the object is parity over and above anything else. When is the King County one? They are four years ahead of us, so they will come up in two years for their next six-year levy. And the past practice has been to mirror, so you can look at it as they're four years ahead of us or we're two years in front of them on the back end. And when we looked into past practice, it had always been to set at what they set, I guess it would be four years ago in this case, which was that 26 and a half cents. And they don't, we don't have an answer from them on what they intend to do firmly in two years. But the best estimate we got at the time was, I believe Chief Kroon talked to somebody in King County, and that estimate was probably staying at 26 and a half cents. Yeah, and Chief Risen has been reaching out too. And I know that um, in the King County Chiefs Association, they'll, They'll be starting to have these conversations probably around the time that this goes to ballot, but that is any early indication is, is that they're looking at recognizing the pressure that's come up tonight of uh, for the King County side to keep it as close to what the current assessment is right now. Oh, it's it's fine. I understand that part. So, but the half a million is just anticipating the rising costs in the next six years since we cannot reset the amount we collect after the voters vote for this, right? Yeah, so if, well, no, if, so if I could just clarify that point. So the 26 and a half cents is the maximum levy rate that you can go up to over the next six year period. But in November or December, when you go through your budget process, you'll be able to actually levy the amount you need, which will translate into a rate. And as long as it's not higher than 26 and a half cents, then it will be fine. And it's that amount then that over the next six year period, you know, can only go up by 1%, you know, in each year. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, it makes sense. Can you book, can you go to the slide, please, that you have that listed just to, uh, for us to... Uh... So there's a 2.2, 2.187 million based on 23 assessed values. Approximately greater than, so half a million, 535,000 greater than that. Okay, can you explain that, that, that bullet then? So I, I think, and again, I didn't prepare this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what that's saying is that if you took the 26 and a half cents and multiplied it by the 2023 assessed value mm -hmm. um, for the Snohomish County side of Bothell, then you would yield, you would be able to collect $500,000 more than you actually budgeted for this year. That's and correct. so that's just giving an indication okay. that, you know, you would at that levy rate, you would be have sufficient capacity to be able to collect what you needed. So that's, the assessed value, 2023 value was not or maybe we did not have that that value for Snohomish County. Is that an average number that you take across the whole county? Then is that what it is? Uh, this the 
2.18 million is produced by multiplying the 26 and a half cents times the entire, the aggregate assessed value. Oh, um, I see. So all the houses. Yeah, that's correct. I on see. the Snohomish side oh, that's the of I see. the okay. bottle. And we did not have that number before we did our estimate for our budget then? I mean, it sounds like now that we have the actual value, we're getting five. Well, million. we're taking a proposed 2024 levy rate and multiplying it by a 2023 assessed value. So I again, see. it's. I think it's just supposed to be illustrative. Okay. Uh, Ted, do you want to? I, I, the only thing I would add to that is that during budget time, we did not have any inkling of what King County was even thinking about doing when the next time they renew their levy. Yeah. Okay. So again, with the budget, it's all based on estimates. So this is the most current estimate that we have. The numbers will likely change as we have the next round of assessed value. They may go up or they may go down. But most likely, you know, they will be um, you know, where, where we are. So, oh, sorry, are you? Okay. So when we propose a levy, there's basically, we say, we say kind of how big we need the pie to be, but every year that there may be more houses that spread that pie out, mm -hmm. people pay a smaller slice in to make this pie for, I, I'm try, I don't know why I'm going with pie, but we'll do it. Um, and so, <laughs> so people's, functional rate could go down if there's more tax base there to provide that whole pie, but it will never also go up to where it exceeds 26 and a half cents for a thousand I think that's the point. This okay. is the maximum rate. Yeah, I just want to make sure because that the way that it actually because people think if my assessed value goes up, you know, 50%, so do my taxes. But with levies, it's actually we just collect what we need to collect. And so you will just pay no more than 101% of what you paid last year. So it, it it's hard to explain conceptually. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that all matches with, with what the smart finance people were saying. Okay. So is there a way for us to see what the King County um, numbers look like, estimated numbers look like? For Bothell? Yeah. We can pull that. Yeah, we'll yeah. get back to you. Yeah, because I'd like to see what The it King County be. side. I think this is this is Snohomish County side. Correct. Two one eight seven, right? So it would be nice to see what the King County side would would yield as well. Um, and then um, to Councilmember Dodd's point, um, while the rate stays the same, assessed values go up, our pro property taxes do go up, right? So we need to, I guess for me, uh, for the community, we need to make sure that we clearly spell out that this levy is not going to increase your taxes, but you are going to have a potentially property tax increase but it may not be due to this levy because of how the levy spread out, correct? Am, yeah. I, am I stating that correctly? Uh, I think th that's a correct statement. Okay, because the community believes that I, when we pass these levies that their property taxes are gonna go up based on the levies. So this is, the EMS levy is among many levies that mm -hmm. uh, the, your local jurisdictions are collecting. Mm -hmm. So we may be just a portion of what is uh, being collected. Yeah, so when we, so the thing that I'm hearing is we have a bunch of levies, mm -hmm. right? And we say, well, this is only gonna amount to $20 a year or $100 a year. Um, but we look at those in totality and they could be five, six, seven, a thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. right? And so I wanna make sure that we collectively, I, I think I've spoken to this previously that really like to see what it looks like in the city of Bothell, maybe the council mm -hmm. can, can see what those taxes look like, what we are paying for, right? So that we have a way to talk to the community. Because again, a lot of, a, a, a lot of community members wanna know. What, I mean, when you jump 20% on your, your property value in one year and yet you can't afford to move, there's some concern, some angst in the community. So um, if we could some at some point hear what that or see what that looks like, I think that would be be amazing. Yeah, and Councilmember McNeil, on our on our website we do have using 2021 numbers an illustration of that for both counties. I think um, it's probably through transition of staff and everything of now that we're past the budget, we're past closeout. That's something we can work on updating as well and keep that out front and center for the community. Yes. Ted, do you have anything to add? Nope, sorry, I didn't lower my hand. There we go. So one additional request that I would like to make, um, since this is going to be coming, is this coming back to us? 
Uh, June 13th. Yes, June 13th. Okay, great. Um, since this will be coming back, um, I, I do like to see it calculated out, um, like with the median home price. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I would like to see, you know, the 2017 rate from the, la from the last levy um, calculated out at that rate with the median home price. Um, and then also at the new rate. And so we can actually compare like what the, you know, that, what that line item on our property taxes says, mm -hmm. is it a, the difference between, I don't, well, we haven't calculated it out, so I don't even know. Yeah. When, but yeah, I would, I'd I like to see those kinds of comparisons. We've been able to see that in other um, situations where we're looking at, at tax rates and just, and be able to calculate out what the actual kind of changes using a hypothetical home or a median home. Um, and I think that's useful if we could do that. If it, I'd like to clarify one thing before, if it sounds like we're starting to wrap up, but I just want to make sure that this is true. So I'm mean, hearing the, the questions, I think, of, for factual information about what is the impact to mm -hmm. the Snohomish County portion of Bothell. That's loud and clear. Um, what I want to make sure, too, is that primarily the, the question in front of council, too, is around the big picture question is, should we go back to the voters and ask them to renew a levy that is expiring at the end of this year, right? So the alternative is not to put a levy on the ballot and then there's there's zero revenue. So there's the question one is, do we go back out to the voters and say, would you like to continue the service that you're receiving, which is at parity of King County? The, the second question is, is again, the, there's been a practice in, in Bothell over the years of keeping the parity of the rate the same as what King County has approved so that we don't have a, a distinction between which side of the, the border are you on in terms of that our, our residents are paying the same. And again, we have more control over the Snohomish County side than, than the um, King County side because we're one of many in King County and for the Snohomish County consideration, that's, that's just us on our own. Um, and so what we would be prepared to bring back and with all of these examples is the rate that's shown before you. So I just want to confirm that as we bring this back, that's the scenario. Like we're, we're on track with that is the scenario. We should come back with the assumption of teeing things up of what would be the schedule, what would be the decision before council of putting this on the ballot for, for ballot uh, before the voters and at the rate of 0.265 cents for assessed value and, and then the additional information. Okay, I just... I want to make sure at the at the end of the day that we didn't by clarifying as much about what the impact is for voters that we didn't lose the question. So I wanted to make sure we were right, right on. One uh, just a question follow. What's the if we do not agree to put this on the levy, uh, on the ballot? I mean, what's the what's what could what's the consequence? Of yeah, this? so we would collect zero dollars instead yeah. of. So budget. we will have two point one eight million dollar deficit in the, in the whole so uh, who's going to pay for the services we, we would then have to, yeah then we would have to we'd have to figure yeah, out how then how are we going to spread that differently i don't think that we would propose a policy question to council of not providing advanced life support for because half the, the service is, has to happen it's not like the service has to so somebody has to pay for it. And, I, and i think ultimately that is one of the things in terms of this consideration completely agree that um the, the strain on property tax. We could have a long discussion about what that looks like, and there's many decisions that the council can make. And yes, for this one, this is a one of those pretty pretty core services that we provide. And um, again, would would want to hear from the voters of is this something you want to continue? I think one thing. I think we're all in favor of advanced life support in the Snohomish County part of the city, which I thank you for. Um, I, I think one thing that we all could use is a better way to explain how property taxes are assessed, especially when the assessed value goes up, because that's not as straightforward as a lot of people think. You can look at, I always think of like a, like a Facebook discussion, and you will see people say, oh, it works this way. And then you get like one person who's like, no, it actually works that way. And everyone's like, oh my god, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. But like over and over and over. So I think a, 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 a tool that we can all use to conceptualize that for people is really important. But also that even when you understand how it works, you also know your taxes are going up. So Cr there, there's two things yeah, there. Crystal yeah. clear. And so I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on the variables of what yeah. goes into that scenario. But we will absolutely bring that back. Yes, please let us vote on the yeah. <laughs> We do.
I mean, I'm a yes for parity, a yes for continuing the levy. Um, how much is a life worth kind of a thing? Um, and I think we're, I don't think I need to summarize our discussion anymore. <laughs> All right, next up, we have Agenda Bill 23070, study session to review planning commission findings and recommendations on proposed outdoor dining regulations. City Manager. All right. There we go. All right, I was making sure I was making sure I was buying the right amount of time. So we're going to be joined tonight by Senior Planner Kirsten Mann, uh, who is... Uh, You'll, you might remember from last week, but uh, she's here on a different a different topic for us tonight. Uh, Council will recall that in the in the fall you were presented with a, another interim outdoor dining regulation. They've been coming to you on a six month clip, so you're probably familiar with that. And at that time, the council did give um, direction to staff to bring forward uh, proposed outdoor dining regulations. Uh, to, to break the cycle of interims. Uh, so staff's been, been working on that. They uh, have been moving through the Planning Commission. And again, while this is something that's going to feel familiar to you, and we keep talking about how many touches has the council had on this one, you've talked about the issue a number of times, and now the Planning Commission is looking at it. But again, just to really frame it, we are in a study session, so now you're getting to hear the results of the, the work that staff's put into and the conversations and feedback from public hearing and, and with planning commission of saying, what would this then look like to be ongoing? Uh, again, no decisions are being sought of council tonight, but this is for feedback. And we will, um, we'll be back again if council sees fit for action. With that, Kirsten, I think you're probably pretty close. Yes, I'm just joining as a panelist now, so I should be ready to go. Hello. All right. So as mentioned, we're here to talk about the findings and recommendations from our April 19th pub, uh, public hearing with Planning Commission. Um, and if there are no proposed changes or further discussion warranted, we are recommending moving to a public hearing on June 6th. So just an overview of what is where we've been and where we're going. So on June 9th is when we had first adopted the interim ordinance back in 2020. We've had some subsequent extensions a couple of times. And the last time was back in November with our last extension, including with that the intent to adopt permanent regulations, which is what we're here to talk about tonight. So in terms of the amendments included, there's a number of citywide amendments as well as some specific to the sub areas that we have. In terms of citywide amendments, they fall into a couple different categories. One was we wanted to establish a standard size for the allowance of the tents. This is based on what we've seen happen. So we know that they're all about 1,000 square feet, and that seemed to be fair to say, hey, this is what's been working for people. This is what seems to be fitting into space as well. Let's move forward with that. Another one was we didn't want to trigger any new requirements. There's a lot of parts of the code where if you're adding onto an existing facility, it triggers the need for additional landscaping, additional parking, all those kinds of things. And we wanted to really lower the barriers for these and keep them really accessible for businesses and really easy to implement. So there's a couple of different places in the code that was included in the packet that do that essentially is just saying, hey, we're not considering these the same as a typical addition. It's something different and you don't have to do all this other stuff in order to be compliant. Another one that was important is we wanted to make sure we were retaining green space, both for aesthetics as well as for stormwater. So we haven't seen this proposed yet, but because this could come up in parking lot areas that have required landscaping, we wanted to make sure there wasn't any net loss. So if it worked for a certain configuration for a business to say, hey, we really want to put it here, but we have this landscape strip, we would say, okay, that's that's well and fine, but we do want to make sure we're capturing that somewhere else on the site. So in terms of our two unique fund sub areas, um, part of this was just capturing the citywide regulations and the sub area regulations because they have their own applicability sections. Canyon Park has, I believe, three levels of applicability for what gets triggered for compliance, and downtown is kind of similar. There's a, a level at which your improvements 
trigger additional requirements or not. So just being really clear about what does and doesn't get triggered. So yeah, really just making sure that those citywide standards are mirrored in the sub areas. That's pretty much it for those more general items. Um, downtown, as we know, is a, its own special situation. There's a lot of older businesses, a lot of businesses that already aren't technically compliant with their minimum parking regulations just because it's an older part of town and that wasn't created at the time. So we wanted to make sure that it, the existing businesses that are doing this could remain. And part of that was considering how to handle the parking standards. So what we decided to do was create a minimum allowance to use existing parking stalls without triggering any other form of compliance. That's why it was set at a third is because that's what works for the Julio's and the cottage site. So that's really the minimum amount proposed in order for compliance for Julio's and the cottage. There was a little bit of discussion with planning commission of, hey, would we want to consider a larger number or not? And the feedback we gave was that could be something we think about. But right now, if we wanted to make sure we could just get this going, um, get it into places, installing that minimum doesn't mean we can't change it at some point in the future if the situation arises where someone wants more. and that might be something that people want to talk about and consider. So again, uh, I wanted to keep it fairly brief since it's, I wanted to keep the code changes fairly simple. Uh, usually less code is better code. Um, simple code is better code. So we really wanted to keep things really clear and concise um, and make sure that it was easy to implement for staff too and easy to understand. So that's the bulk of my presentation tonight. So I would open up to questions and comments. I'll, tr I'll tr just jump in. OK. Uh, one is that, uh, it's, which is going as a preface for uh, a question, is that I know the businesses you cited, Cottage and Julio's, mm -hmm. the businesses on the other half of the strip on the south end, is my compass right, po points on the compass right, really struggle with having parking for their customers. Mm. Um, and so one of my questions is, it is privately owned. With the code, because I did go through and look at the code, does this still allow the property owners who own the property to say, yes or no, you may not put outdoor dining on this? It, does that still allow them to have the freedom to say, yes, I know the code allows you, but, but the other businesses need this parking, in theory? To the best of my knowledge, that would be a private matter. Okay. It's, I would kind of almost think about it similarly as other private property matters we get asked about, like property line disputes or things with HOAs. It's not okay. a city regulation, and I don't think there's anything in there that would preclude them from saying to the, to the business renters, no, we don't want you to do this. Because I, yeah. I think they do need approval from the property owner okay. to do it. Part of me is like, that's not my business. That's between the business owners and the and the landlord to to flesh that out mm -hmm. on what works, um, and then so that still would allow property owners to say, hey, you're using parking spots that could be used for customers. We're going to charge you X number of dollars for using the square footage. Could, does that, do they still have the freedom to say that in their? I can't think how we would be able to even know that that was happening, let alone but, regulate it. But but a yeah. landlord could do that in theory if they... As far as I know, yeah. That would, okay. That wouldn't be something we regulate. Okay. All right. I just wanted to ask that. And then I'll try to go through my questions um, quickly. On page 52, there was an exemption of no parking spots for outdoor dining and vendor trucks, carts, spaces, or stalls. That's We're just talking food trucks. Is that right? On page 52, there's no minimum parking spaces required? Yeah, and that, that was in the code before. So okay. for, for that section, we just wanted to clean up the table okay. so it was a little less cluttered. No, I liked and it. So we combined the uses that already don't trigger requirements and just put them all in one line okay. item. All right, on to the next page. All right. Um, OK, you answered that question. We're, we're moving through. Um, I guess my only comment was on page 58, up to one third of existing parking spaces may be utilized. I kind of, my gut reaction was, depending on context, that's kind of a big reduction, but that's just an opinion. 
Um, and then page 61. Yeah, and that, that was the minimum I mentioned that permits the Julio's and Cottage site to still be compliant. Yeah, I do appreciate that it's citywide. And then my last was on page 64. Uh, Joanne Harkonnen has uh, some, I thought, really interesting questions, and I was wondering if Planning Commission talked about this, because she sent this March 1st. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, her third and fourth questions. Um, how, how are we um, looking at other businesses in these areas being impacted? And I think, since we're talking about private parking, we're putting the responsibility on the business owners and the tenants there. Is that correct? Yeah, and the feedback that we had at that time when that was our first study session with Planning Commission was we haven't heard much of people's concerns yet. Um, so we didn't have a way to really address the concerns that we hadn't heard, okay. sort of. Um, and then for question four, we said, you know, there's, there isn't necessarily any reason, but that's just what's being discussed right now in terms of parking areas for other types of businesses. Okay, so, so if somebody had a retail store and wanted to have a sidewalk sale out in the parking spots, would they be allowed to do that city code-wise or would that just be strictly be a landlord situation? Right now our code doesn't really speak to that because the code that talks about vendor trucks and stalls is under the land use table for eating and dining. Okay. Uh, but it is something that we could consider as an allowance in the future. I know it's been discussed. Okay. Um, but I could see that as a kind of maybe a, a separate but related topic that we could address at some point. Right. Well, sure. and, there's, and there's, I think in the past we've had businesses who've wanted to have special events that would spill out into the parking mm -hmm. spots. So um, I don't know where you want to put that in the docket of your scope of work, but I'm sure that there is... Not, not in the too far distant future, mm -hmm. interest in can we use those parking spots for other things and how would the city allow us to do mm -hmm. that? And that is unrelated to this, a discussion that staff has kind of already been having in the background for some other topics is um, the utilization of outdoor areas for different types of sales opportunities. So I think it definitely could be something we talk about down the line. Okay, all right, thank yeah. you. I would add to some of that does already happen. So I've, Personally, I've seen it at Fred Meyer, Home Depot. Um, First in Maine has done markets with different organizations behind it. Um, so businesses do already get to do that flex. I don't know in our code at what point they have to talk to the city before they do it. But luckily, we do see that, and, it, and it's pretty fun. Although, I mean, bags of bark at Home Depot is not fun, unless you're looking for bark, I guess. But okay. like, <laughs> some of the sales are pretty fun. How else would we, get, would we get our Christmas trees? I do appreciate how um, you really did try to make this pretty simple. Um, and, and I think that uh, number three on page 59 really summarizes quite well um, what, you're, what you're proposing to us. And so that's amending one, two, three, four, five, six sections of the code. Um, and, and you outlined it really well tonight too. So, um, thanks for making it accessible and understandable because mm -hmm. code can be complicated yes. and, and I really do appreciate your efforts. Thanks. I have to admit, yes, I understood something for the first time. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Time. So, uh, that was fun reading it. Thanks. I'd uh, echo what Councilmember Zorn said. Um, I would love for this to be available to other businesses as well, not just restaurants. Um, you know, the amount of public comment we got in support of this last time was pretty impressive. Um, and I just loved uh, to hear you say, the simpler the better when it comes to code. It makes my heart sing. So thank you for that. I'm, uh, I'm gonna be in support of this. Um, I enjoy the spaces that are there right now. I've had mayors from other cities reach out and ask me about it and come have lunch and check it out because they want to do something similar in their in their cities as well. It's mm -hmm. something that I think is being pretty well received around the region and um, I'm excited we have it here. I'm also excited to uh, know that it's not just a downtown um, option for businesses, that we are um, 
basically creating the freedom and flexibility for other businesses throughout the city um, to experience similar benefits. Um, and I think that when we talk about um, like vibrant neighborhoods and how we really want each neighborhood to feel a sense of of community and um, and I'm going to use the word vibrancy. Like this is one of those things that like one of those actions that we can take as council and as the city to to help them bring people in and and feel like they're they're celebrating their their little sp pot, uh, spot of the city. So thanks. I appreciate that call out. I, council member Aldrich and I were both on the planning commission working on the Canyon Park area sub regulation sub area regulations, and it's great that this will be hopefully in place as we see a big change over the next, you know, 30, 40 years in Canyon Park, um, so that in my golden years I can enjoy it. <laughs> All right. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you have everything you need? Yeah, I think so. I think next step is we'll, um, we already have the public hearing on our calendar, so we'll go ahead and get everything ready to go for noticing and all that. Awesome. So, thank you so much. Yeah, really you. appreciate your work on this. Yeah, for sure. All right, next up we have Agenda Bill 23071, Shoreline Management Code Amendments. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. So this is our third of three study sessions, and uh, we'll be focusing on, as you said, Shoreline Management Code Amendments. I do want to just clarify, too, that this is the, the study session with the anticipated next step being to bring a public hearing forward to the council on June 13th. But we'll see how, how tonight goes and go from there. I'm going to introduce Dave Boyd, who is joining us remotely tonight, to just do a little bit of framing and then introduce our, uh, our consultants. He's here to guide us through the presentation. So looking forward to learning more tonight. Thank you and good evening. Um, uh, it's my, my pleasure tonight to uh, um, introduce uh, Amy Sumi from Shannon Wilson. She's been our uh, consultant uh, go going all the way back to the uh, uh, 2012 Shoreline Master Program update. She also helped out with the 2019 update and with these most recent uh, updates. So what, uh, tonight, um, I'm going to share my screen and start a presentation, and then I'll turn it over to Amy. Um, so we're bringing you tonight uh, for study session um, uh, the Shoreline Board recommendations. I get to start here um, for uh, Shoreline Board Shoreline uh, Code uh, amendments. Um, and what we're looking for from uh, Council is feedback uh, on the Shoreline Board recommendations. Uh, as outlined in the agenda bill. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy to uh, go through the show. Is that how I, oh, yes, it is. Okay. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, apologies first for my voice. Allergies are trying to take it. Um, I'm not sick, um, but it might come and go. Um, so just a quick background on the Shoreline Master Program and uh, first, maybe a nod to Kirsten, who said that less code is better code, and unfortunately, the Shoreline Master Program does not work that way. Um, so I apologize for that. It's not my fault. <laughs> um, as Dave mentioned, there was a comprehensive update back in 2012, 2013, which was a major overhaul of the entire Shoreline Master Program um, with a lot of analysis and uh, restoration plan and a whole bunch of other public outreach, et cetera. Um, and then since that time, this is the second now of what are called periodic updates, which are just little intrusions into the master program to catch up with changes in best available science or changes in existing conditions within the city itself, um, or just fixes of things that um, the planning department or, or uh, the public have found don't work as well as they hoped when they initially crafted the regulation. So um, also since that time, there has been we looked at the special flood hazard areas regulations, which the city updated in 2020. Thanks. <laughs> um, and I'll talk more about this later, but essentially um, those were also in Chapter 1313, 
of the Shoreline Master Program, and those have been removed. I'll talk a little bit more about how and why. And then finally, there was also um, some other critical areas regulations updates in 1404 back in 2021. And there's a number of changes that we're proposing in this body of uh, code amendments that are just for consistency's sake with those 2021 updates where we looked at a lot of science, um, also we're responding to <clears throat> Parametrics's uh, feedback um, during their surface water master plan update. And so that update picked up a, a bunch of different things. Uh, next slide, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so kind of the, the main items that were used to form the uh, basis for our code amendments was first the Shorelines Board <clears throat> had asked for a long time to take another look at the buffer reduction mechanisms, um, how they worked, whether they were necessary, that sort of thing. And so we spent a lot of time exploring that. Um, again, the recent updates to uh, Municipal Code Chapter 1404, we looked at those and where appropriate strove for consistency between what are otherwise very similar critical areas regulations language in both codes. Uh, we removed the special flood hazard area regulations from the Shoreline Master Program. And then there was um, a great deal of activity around a wash dot 405 SR 527 project that went to the hearing examiner. And there was a lot of Department of Ecology engagement trying to understand the code and how it applies. Variances were sought and ultimately obtained. And out of that process, um, the hearing examiner uh, included a number of recommendations that we looked at to try and make sure that that sort of uh, confusion doesn't happen again and simplify things. Um, as usual, Department of Ecology has continued to update their best available science uh, guidance documents and provided some other input, so we took a look at that. And then finally, there was just a variety of kind of non-substantive housekeeping changes that we made um, in the text. And in my presentation tonight, I'm just focusing on what I think are some of the, the highlights and are things that you didn't already review as part of the critical areas regulations update. So. We don't need to kind of rehash that stuff um, uh, unless you want to, which I'm happy to do. Um, so the first one I wanted to touch on is what started out as a housekeeping kind of a change and then um, grew a little bit more when Department of Ecology took another look at it. So um, in the current code, there is a note on the Shoreline uh, Environment Designations maps that says, regardless of the mapping, if it's a city right-of-way associated with a road, it's automatically high intensity. And we said that just because it's really hard to catch all these little slivers when you're doing the environment designation mapping, but that was the intent and that was expressed um, on the adopted maps. But it wasn't specifically stated in the code text. It was just on the map, which was adopted. And so we thought, oh, it'd be nice and clean if we just put that uh, note map right into the text. Uh, but that sort of begged the question um, of what the date is. Like, are we continuing to designate rights of way and suddenly now we have more area that's high intensity that wasn't really considered back in the original update? And so with Ecology's input, the code was amended so that it does state that rights of way are high intensity regardless of mapping, but it's rights of way designated as of a certain date. So if new rights of way are designated, you would need to amend the, um, the map formally through a, a Shoreline Code Amendment process with public input, ecology review, et cetera, um, or find another kind of a regulatory way to accomplish what you need to within that high intensity um, or within that right of way area. So um, that is an explanation of that. Next slide. And I'll just jump in and say that the, the date will be the effective date of these, these uh, code amendments. amendments. 
Uh, this next one um, also was um, provided a lot of discussion, and this is one of those things that it really came out of that 405-527 project with WashDOT, um, and then also considering some other potential city projects where there was improvements in roadways that um, abutted natural environment designation areas. Um, which is the most protective environment designation. And the way the SMP read is that any kind of a fill um, within the natural environment of a floodplain was automatically prohibited. But with the position and locations of the roads, the natural environment designation, et cetera, it became evident that really it should be a conditional use permit, which would allow um, folks to pursue a fill for those special cases where for existing public transportation and there's no other way to improve an existing road we don't want to relocate it out of shoreline jurisdiction um, but to do it right in that footprint and expand it as needed so there is a process now where when necessary and for only existing bridges trails roads um, that you could with a conditional use permit um, have a fill within a floodplain outside of the floodway, so it's a, a less sensitive portion of the floodway. And you would, of course, still have to go through the usual mitigation sequencing process, avoid it if you can, minimize it, those types of things. So um, there's a lot of other environmental protections uh, that would still come into play uh, in this scenario. Uh, this next one, again, is related, I think, to the 527-405 project. The code currently just prohibits just outright modifications to wetlands unless it's related to a water dependent or a public access and recreation use um, based on a presumption that any other kind of use could be located somewhere else. Again, with roads, which are you know rather unique, you can't just put an improved roadway somewhere else. And so the way around that was to change the shall be prohibited to shall not be permitted. Ecology didn't want to um, just have an open doorway for that kind of thing. So instead of an outright prohibition, which is really hard to get around, um, shall not be permitted gives you an opportunity to pursue a variance. And then you can kind of make your case for why you need to have that proposed wetland fill for this particular project and satisfy those criteria, go through city process, and go through an ecology process. So that was kind of the way we were able to um, open the door just a little bit and allow those kinds of projects. And then wetland buffers, um, we spent a lot of time talking about the wetland buffers and the different ways that they could be divided up um, into different buckets based on habitat points. Um, originally, our thought was that we would just match the existing critical areas regulations, which were updated um, just a couple years ago to match Department of Ecology's three-tier system, where it's just three to four points or three to five, then six to seven, and eight to nine. <clears throat> but after a bunch of analysis and discussion and what kind of the implications were for Bothell's shoreline wetlands in particular, the shorelines board um, landed on keeping the four bucket system that you see on the screen here. The, um, well, that actually, I'll get to that. The, what they kept the system that they already have um, and the, Minimum and the maximum buffer widths are the same, but it's kind of those in-between steps where you end up with some differences on the ground with real projects, um, and they didn't want to see a reduction in buffer widths um, within shoreline jurisdiction where it's um, believed to be you know, that much more important in supporting salmon habitat and all the other benefits of shoreline areas. Um, so what we did do, though, and this was more to at least match the structure of the critical areas regulations, um, was to add another table that just very clearly states that you have a standard set of buffers, and these are what they are, and that's the table you already have. Um, if you implement these minimization measures, and there's a table of minimization measures that was in there before, we've updated it. Um, and it's just kind of standard BMPs, best practices for developing um, properties near wetlands or buffers. But then in the existing code, there was a little bit of ambiguity on, well, what if you don't do the minimization measures? And so in the, ex 
the critical areas regulations code in 1404, there is another table that says, if you don't do the minimization measures, this is what it looks like. And it provides this table that you see on the screen here that has um, increased buffer widths for that scenario. And the code already kind of says this. It's just a little bit lost in text. It's a little ambiguous on when or if the city would apply it. And this just makes it crystal clear, matching the critical areas regulations format, and then also consistent with um, Department of Ecology's preference for how these things are presented. And I think it just um, is easier for staff and easier for the public to kind of understand what, what their options are. And then the shoreline buffer reduction option, there was, again, a lot of discussion about whether or not the buffer reduction option should be retained. And what I'm referring to is that um, the standard buffer um, in most of the city is 100 feet off of shoreline water bodies. But for certain types of activities in particularly the shoreline residential and high intensity environment designations, you could reduce that buffer um, without having to go through the very extensive process of a shoreline variance by uh, implementing various enhancements um, or implementing you know, different practices into the project. And that would enable the, you to get down to, I think it's 60 feet, 60 feet or 40 feet, I can't remember now off the top of my head. But um, they decided after looking at, again, kind of the rationale for this whole approach and then looking at how many properties um, really have the opportunity to pursue such a, a reduction um, to eliminate that opportunity for new development in those two uh, environment designations because there just aren't very many um, undeveloped, like com neutral, completely undeveloped properties that would be able to do this. Um, but they did elect to maintain that option for substantial redevelopment, which I think is the, the greater issue. Because as you can see in this picture, most of the development within shoreline jurisdiction is well within the 100 foot buffer. And folks would have a very difficult time you know, modifying, rebuilding, um, redeveloping their, their single family homes in that same footprint. They would have to be 100 feet away um, in a road potentially or, um, you know, in some other circumstance that doesn't work um, or they'd have to go and get a variance. And the variance criteria are very challenging and it would just be a lot of process, a lot of expense for the public, for the city, um, and then ultimately put the decision in the hands of Department of Ecology <laughs> and whether or not a given a redevelopment could have a, a reduced buffer. So the idea is, again, to try and, and help existing um, development patterns be maintained and people could still maintain their properties and redevelop without excess process. And then the removal of the 30-foot bridge limit. So in, this is something that we already did in the critical areas regulations. Um, and the proposal was to take that limit out of the Shoreline Master Program regulations as well, where it only allowed within buffers uh, new or improved bridges um, that were up to 30 feet. And then otherwise, you would have to pursue some sort of, again, a variance or some other process. And that 30 feet felt a little bit small um, based on the type of projects that are going to happen. And also with all of the other protections um, and uh, environmental restrictions that are in the code for that kind of project, and the fact that you might have to get a conditional use permit for other reasons anyway, it seemed reasonable to just remove that limit and let all of those other regulations um, and design standards and safety standards, et cetera, for road design kind of drive uh, the ship on, on what an appropriate width was for a given project. Um, there was concerns about that, of course, again, because this is shoreline jurisdiction. We're talking about the Sammamish River um, and North Creek. So there was some additional mitigation considerations that were added uh, to kind of balance the removal of that 30-foot limit. So um, an applicant would have to more thoughtfully and clearly describe what the potential impacts were to riparian vegetation or to um, increases in shade 
um, over water cover into that aquatic environment and then address those depending on what the, the analysis found. So that was kind of how that was packaged. And I'll add that we, we also did consult with our capital projects group oh, um, yes. since this, this could very well come into play uh, with a number of uh, capital project um, efforts in the coming years. Yep. Um, so that, I think that wraps it up. Um, again, those were just the, the high points and a lot of the bulk of the actual amendments are things that you have seen before uh, in the critical areas regulations updates back in 21. So uh, open it up for questions. Uh, the next step uh, here, uh, we've scheduled a public hearing on June 13th uh, and would be um, looking to take care of uh, SEPA and other uh, um, noticing requirements um, uh, ahead of that date. And then, um, so the again, the what we're looking for tonight is any direction uh, that council has on the short these shoreline board recommendations uh, to bring back uh, to council on June thirteenth. Can I die? So that I'll stop sharing. I can before, go back to any of these images if you have. I want to make a request Maybe. before you jump in, um, just for you know visual learners out there. Can we go back to the map of the shorelines that's at the beginning of the presentation so that can help center us as we talk? Thank you. Go ahead, Jean. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, no, that's totally fine. Um, that one, right? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, one, thank you for the to the to um, our planning department and our shoreline because this was monumental work, and I think you have to kind of be a shoreline nerd to really get into this. Um, and then, so I have a few comments um, for bridges like the 102nd or going over North Creek, that's gonna be heavily regulated, have engineering regulations, Department of Ecology, and so yes. I'm comfortable um, with those, um, those um, assessments. Um, also, could we have the Shoreline Board join us on January 13th to kind of answer any questions we might have with their findings? June. Or June, June, yeah, sorry, June 13th. Could we invite Shoreline Board to come and help answer any questions we have in June? We're, um, we, can, uh, we can look into that. Uh, we're in a kind of an unusual situation. We don't actually have a shoreline board right now. Um, uh, only one of the shoreline board members applied uh, to be reappointed. All of their, their terms expired in March of this year. Uh, so that's one of those issues that, uh, uh, again, your is coming back to you. I, I believe in September from the discussion earlier on uh, in the meeting. So, so, um, so we could I, we could still we'll survey the ones who were part of that conversation, invite them to come talk yes. to us about it. Okay, yeah. even though on our end we paused it, they they're still part of that brain trust in how we got we got to this point, right? Um, and then the uh, so that would be great if we could do that. And then, uh, and then they had asked that staff write a letter regarding middle housing. And as I was looking at what, uh, you know, along the slough with um, Brackett's Landing area, if that, am I recalling right? I'm sitting here thinking middle housing is if they must have opinions about building within the footprint versus adding an ADU, because once you put an ADU on those properties, you've now taken away pervious soil that's going to be filtering along those critical areas of the river. So um, if that letter covers those topics about what they like and what their concerns about what middle housing should look a lot look like along shoreline areas, that would be um, good to get that information when we start talking about middle housing when we had that piece. And then for my own, I know I saw floodplain versus floodway somewhere here in the agenda packet. Could you, one is has a bigger impact than the other. Could you explain that? Yeah, um, the, there's typically the 100 year floodplain and then within that there is a, um, a higher uh, protected area of called the floodway. And so we've got uh, special provisions for that are very restrictive in a flood way 
you don't see those on the screen, but within the floodway, there is a lot of very uh, special restrictions. And then outside of the floodway, but still within the 100-year floodplain, that's where um, we propose to still allow an opportunity for uh, development to take place related to existing bridges and trails. Because in theory, you would only, it would only be an issue every 100 years. In theory. In theory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Even if they happen every five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I'm interested in what they, what, Gene, what you brought up about middle housing, but I, I don't know that I understand why middle housing, which would only be built in the footprint of a single family home, would have different regulations on surface area coverage. So I think I would just want to not apply more burden on that than any other development. And, and in that vein, I don't know that I'm understanding the concept of having different buffer rules for new development along the shoreline versus substantial redevelopment. It, I, I don't see that if, if it's, it's so impactful that we wouldn't allow it for new development, why would we allow it for substantial redevelopment? I think that's my, my pause there. One of the kind of unique things about shoreline jurisdiction that's a little different from standard critical areas regulations is the um, principle of no net loss of ecological functions and a expressed intent to uh, recognize what the existing condition is and then kind of take that forward in, th in your regulations um, in establishing buffers and that sort of thing. So um, this is a little bit unique I think because the city opted to have a buffer, to set the buffer much larger than what existing conditions would have otherwise kind of led you toward. And the reason they did that is, I think, because there's the idea that the river really does need to be protected. that has got a lot of values. Um, and so they wanted to say the 100 foot buffer. But on the other hand, they also recognize that there's an awful lot of people here that are suddenly non-conforming um, to that buffer and that could be frozen essentially in their current state if there weren't an avenue for them to reduce the buffer to essentially match the existing condition a little bit. And so that was sort of a very long process went into figuring out exactly what the buffer um, reduction allowances should be so that you have to you don't just get to reduce the buffer by asking for it you have to add vegetation you have to um, restore or convert impervious surfaces to pervious surfaces maybe you have to add large woody debris um, it's a kind of a whole menu of things that people can choose from in order to get that so the idea is that if with substantial redevelopment, even if your, your buffer on paper is getting smaller, you're actually getting increased ecological function relative to that existing condition. So it seemed like a really good way to not punish the people who are already there and have their homes and there's this very um, uh, prevalent pattern of development, but also achieve some improvement and lift. So it's, it was a little bit of a a win-win, um, but if you took that away from the substantial redevelopment, then again, you'd be leaving an awful lot of people needing to pursue a variance to do anything um, and a lot of non-conforming development, which um, doesn't really serve anybody. Um, I think there was another part to your question. Oh, new redevelopment, new development. So again, we looked um, very closely at that. I think there was kind of two things that came out of that one is that the shorelines board, as we analyzed it, there was so few properties where there was new development potential within shoreline jurisdiction. And I think one of them was actually that opportunity's gone now. It um, was at the Bothell Townhomes 32, I'm gonna butcher the name of it. It's next to Lazy Wheels, I think, or the way. That's I'm right. Thinking. Yeah, um, that was one of the probably prime opportunities for new development, and they've already, I think, proposed and taken advantage of the buffer reduction measure. So there, I think, was maybe one or two others scattered around the city that could have. Um, and so I think the Shorelines Board is very protective of the river and um, North Creek and thought that for those very few properties that are left, um, the emphasis really should be on preserving the opportunity to have a wider area of ecological function, like a, a, a more typical functioning buffer width. And if 
because of what they want to do, because of um, the particularities of the project or the property, they did find that that just wasn't tenable, then they still could pursue a shoreline variant. So it's not like all roads are closed, but this sort of um, easier pathway that accomplishes a win-win, um, they felt like should be retained. Whereas the new development, I think they didn't feel like it was a win-win, it was more of a loss. Okay, thank you. So. Dave, did, did I get that right, do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, okay. that, that's great. I don't, don't have anything to add to that. Okay. I'm going to jump in because Councilman Dodd talked to something or spoke to something that I was going to talk at as well. Um, it seems like the overall theme here is that we're liberalizing shoreline rules for roads and we're tightening them up for buildings. Would you say that's fair? Like all, all of the exceptions were, you know, removing the bridge limits and allowing fill. So like if we if we drive on something, we will sacrifice the shoreline for that. But if we build something, we won't for that. We were, we were sensitive to that too. Um, and most of the carve outs, it's to recognize existing transportation, mm -hmm. not like new roads and new, um, um, new other kinds of infrastructure. So um, I think that's how we balanced it is just practically speaking, there isn't another way to improve 102nd where it wouldn't need to get a little bit wider to meet current safety standards um, for for pedestrians, um, for roads. Maybe there's stormwater infrastructure, et cetera, in there. And so it just it didn't seem like it added any value. And so that's and I think particularly with adding those additional mitigation considerations, there's already. Uh, so much protection of wetlands and floodplains and um, not just by the shoreline master program but also by other regulators that forcing folks to go through a process for those types of public good sorts of improvements um, didn't seem to have any added value to it. I think and I think and Amy touched on this be earlier in their presentation but uh, uh, a building can be recited somewhere else outside of the jur jurisdiction. Uh, these existing roadways uh, can't. So yeah, and and part of one of the things that we were looking at very specifically was to respond to the the hearing examiner's recommendations related to that transportation project. And so that which, sort of which we want to have. Yeah, it's, yes. a, good, it's a good project. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of that drove a little bit the fact that we were thinking about transportation. Um, but and we did try, I would say, not to make things harder for, for other kinds of buildings. I think the exception would be removing that buffer reduction potential for new development. And again, we just found there was maybe one or two properties that even had potential to be classified in that way. Okay. Um I I can I can get behind the um the liberalizing the rules for roads. The um if there's only a lot or two in the city that this is affecting, um, it doesn't seem like it's going to have a very big impact for the city of Bothell. And if I owned one of those properties and I was possibly interested in putting a home there someday, uh, I don't think I would like it very much if things were made a lot more difficult for me. Um, I don't know that I, I don't know that I'm on board with that part of it. Um, primarily just because there's only a couple, and it's not going to make a. I mean, a huge difference. And I, and I believe you said uh, part of the exchange there in that reduction is for improvements along the shoreline, correct? Mm -hmm. And I would like to see those improvements happen. And if somebody building a house there gets us A, a house, and B, improvements on the shoreline, that seems like a win-win to me. So I don't think I want to close that pathway down. Yeah, this was um, this exact point is what the shoreline board spent a lot of time going back and forth on, uh, with some saying it's only one or two properties and others saying it's only one or two properties. Yeah, like yeah. you could look at it either way. Totally. So What's the acreage that you're talking about, the size of the lots. Ooh, um, of those one or two, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I don't think it was much more than a hundred feet. Maybe I don't know, David, if you can recall. I, I didn't. I couldn't hear the uh, question. What are the sizes of the lots? I mean, are we talking about something that's just single family size, or is it something that you could put a row of townhomes on? Um, well, 
most of the residential development along the shoreline, uh, I believe, is our 9600. So a um, little under t or around 10,000 square foot lots. Um, but this also applies uh, in the business parks to some degree where uh, we have some uh, commercial buildings that are um, within the buffer. Uh, so it would also allow us, you know, some reasonable expansion without increasing the uh, nonconformity um, in both of those situations. And I don't know if you have access to all of the Shoreline's board materials for each meeting, but we could probably provide the one that provided an analysis parcel by parcel of development potential or redevelopment potential so you could see which, which two properties. We, we did a very thorough assessment of that. I, I would like I believe to see you. that. Um, and if I were to guess, one of those properties is right around the bend um, at the Sammamish River between 522 and the Sammamish River. There's a like an empty lot that I've heard talk of being developed. And maybe that is too specific for this conversation, but, but if I were to guess, that might be one of them that has development poten potential. Dave is visualizing. <laughs> I think I know the parcel you're talking about, whether it has development potential or not. Uh, if it's the one I'm thinking of, it's it's um, very minimal development potential. On the um, reduced um, buffer there, do you know how many properties are that fall within that? How many properties have yeah, like I'm, I'm, are within the buffer, basically? Yeah, non-conforming. Within shoreline jurisdiction, I, I don't know if we have the exact number, but I would say it's the vast majority. Of the properties along there? Yeah, yeah, so it could along be the whole river. 100, 200. Yeah, I don't homes. know how many parcels we could probably okay. come up with that, but yeah, uh, there are not many that, are, that could comply or that are complying with the 100 foot buffer. Okay. Um, and as an example, there's one up on the, the top that's 45 feet back. If somebody owned that property and wanted to put an ADU in their backyard, would this help them to be able to do that? I think it, I think it would. I mean, it, the, the regulation is there already. Um, mm -hmm. So this isn't a new regulation, but I think that it would allow them to put an ADU in there if they had you know, could choose from that menu of minimize, of um, reduction options, and then we're able to whittle it down from 45 to 40 or whatever the value is. Um, mm -hmm. If they wanted to go any further than, than what the easy pathway, where you can offer enhancements um, and then just whittle it down, if they needed to go even farther, then they'd have to go get a shoreline variance, um, which would probably be a pretty hard, hard sell. Okay. So they probably wouldn't fall under the standard new put no that would be that would be a kind of part of the substantial redevelopment or um maybe even less than that because okay. um, it's based on the i think the assessed value of the existing parcel okay that 50 percent. i wonder if a, a better example for that case would be the the buffer that has 73 feet like it would be easier yeah, that would for be the a lot home easier. with 73 feet to put an ADU on than it would be for yeah. the shortest, which is 41. Yeah. Yeah. That would be challenging, probably. Buffer or no buffer. Well, <clears throat> but yeah. Um, they're non-conforming, but I just want to make sure I'm understanding, like yeah. you know, what what that what that actually means. Um, and when you when we talk about the what we look at city limits only the city of Bothell is that correct? Shoreline? Right. Okay. Um, I believe so. One of the things that um, that we talked about when I first got on council seven over seven and a half years ago was um, the shoreline of the entire Sammamish River and its tributaries and studies. And have has the shoreline board done any um, studies related to the entire Sammamish? So as an example... We're talking about the city of Buffalo and the effects of 
what happens here in the city of Bothell. But was there any work done on looking at the entire tributary um, holistically? Like what our impacts that we're talking about today in Redmond and Issaquah and Woodenville and all the cities along, ha have we done any, or has our shoreline done any work with, with that, continued any work with that? I'm trying to think how to answer that. Can I Oh, go ahead, Dave. Um, well, what they have done, not not with these code amendments, but um, uh, with the previous round uh, and with some of the, the critical areas code amendments, um, there have been some uh, amendments that have uh, opened the door somewhat uh, to offsite mitigation uh, within what's called the service area. Uh, and there's a wetland mitigation bank uh, outside of Redmond that qualifies, that's in our service area. Uh, so um, uh, those opportunities have, have been uh, made uh, possible to, to uh, utilize uh, with some previous amendments. They're not part of this package though. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the reason I'm just asking the question more or less to ascertain what, you know, we're doing work here in Bothell but what does that look like holistically and how does it affect the, the entire tributary? And, yeah. you know, I think the mayor and council member Dodd brought up the, uh, the point about roads and, and, and housing. Um, and the thing that came to my mind was when we talk about filling wetlands, what, what, what does filling wetlands mean? And we're, we're filling it for roads or are we filling it for um, any other parts of the city or what? I mean, I'm not sure I quite understood what, meant by filling wetlands. It's, it's only for uh, improvements to existing roadways. Uh, and, and even then it's quite uh, tightly constrained. Uh, so, uh, but it was a, it was something that the current code created uh, oh. some significant hurdles for the 405 project uh, when it went through the hearing examiner uh, process. And, and it was the hearing examiner that suggested that we make some uh, revisions to the code so that uh, they didn't have to do quite as many uh, legal uh, <laughs> gymnastics to, yeah. to do that sort of thing. Yeah. And we, we did also talk with, um, or Dave talked with the, the roads people within the city to ask them about future projects. And if just to confirm, like, are there any roads that the city needs to improve for, for safety um, and just to upgrade um, to meet current standards? And are they proximal to wetlands and or floodplains where there would be a conflict? And there were a couple projects that potentially had, had that, um, element to it as well. So it seemed like there's a real need for that. And again, transportation is fairly unique in that you can't just relocate it somewhere else. Um, and the improvements need to happen adjacent and on top of the existing roadway. So, um, and as we mentioned too, there is an incredible amount of protective regulation of wetlands and the environment in general um, contained within the shoreline master program within other provisions. So the whole package um, really, uh, I think, holds the line on um, protecting environmental functions while still allowing important projects. And those projects would have mitigations as well? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and so the last, um, the last item I had, a little checkbox here, was the, the mitigation for uh, those buffers and the kind of the menu that you pick through. Yeah. And um, what when we talk about menus and picking through things, it's like if you if you change something to where you can build a house on a lot, but you have a tree ordinance that doesn't allow you to build on a lot, it's a problem, right? So the question I have is around that is would that menu, is the menu gonna become cost prohibitive for those folks to be able to do something based on the mitigation they have to do? Um, and I'm only merely asking the question because, you know, if you have to, if you take one tree down and you got to plant 100 trees, it becomes at some point cost prohibitive to do that, right? So I just want to make sure I'm kind of understanding how how that mitigation piece would come into play on the, on a reduced menu buffer. Yeah, the, there's a variety of options that folks can choose, ranging from 
plantings, which are pretty cost effective, especially if you feel like doing it yourself, um, to probably more robust things. Like if you were gonna put large woody debris or something and have that anchored into um, the riverbank, then you would be looking at state and federal permitting and engineering and you know a variety of things. But um, we tried to make the menu um, have options that could kind of meet different folks' needs. Um, but also that menu was driven by the analysis we did in 2012, looking at what does the river actually need and what sorts of improvements would really um, increase uh, ecological function in, um, of that shoreline area. So, so it's kind of driven by both of those considerations. Great, and I think the last, the last piece you touched on is what, the, what it actually needs, the environment actually needs, is, is probably the most important piece, so thank you. Yeah. I can pull it back up if we need, but it sound, sounded like we were coming to the end of the discussion. So uh, that was some good input. Um, one takeaway is um, typically when, when a board makes a recommendation, we ask the chair to come and, and um, be part of that discussion. And of course, other board members are, are welcome to come and, and uh, testify as well. But um, uh, we can do that for the, the June 3rd public uh, hearing. Dave, the one other um, takeaway that, that I got and will commit to following up with council on is that there was some analysis that Amy referenced that the Shoreline Board received. So we'll go through and make sure we find that packet and we'll email that out. I, I know you all can find it on the website too, but we'll make sure to get that out this week so that you have plenty of time before the next touch in case there's anything in the analysis there that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, council conversations. I didn't. I, I was. I was. I was going to bring it up that I knew my 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 task. <laughs> Your assignment. Council member, my assignment. Um, I did not make my assignment this week, but I will make sure that I um, I'm up early enough to uh, to get with them this week between now and the next meeting. So. I just want to say that Hank the fish survived the sound. And uh, that's been fun. Um, each year where we participate in the in the survive the sound, um, like about salmon spawning. And for I think this might be the second year in a row that the city of Bothell agreed to rep have Hank represent us, a very cute little uh, Coast Salish design fish in, in purple and teal. And um, yeah. This, last year, our, our Hank did not survive the sound. This year, our Hank did, and that was exciting. I had. I was going to say Go that ahead. is that is fun, and I wish I had little kids to participate in it. You have one. I do, and this is actually kind of about him, but a different topic, not fish. Um, so I do have to call out a long list of people. Um, uh, Shelton View Elementary had a lockdown uh, yesterday. And the Bothell police were there in 60 seconds. The North Shore School District, not just the security team, but all the school staff, lots of other staff. I saw Superintendent, Superintendent Tolly there. Um, and all the kids seemed to do pretty great. Everybody was glad to see their parents. Um, and all the parents were calm in the reunification line. It was a very smooth process with a lot of obviously frazzled nerves. And everybody did as, as well as I could ask personally, not being an expert in any of these things. And so it was great to see large chunks of our community with different perspectives coming together and supporting the kids and, and ensuring safety. So I just wanted to shout out kind of everybody there. Yeah, it's, um, you, you hear about swatting in national news and you think, mm, nobody's gonna pay attention to the little Bothell and pull that trick on Bothell, and yet, they found one little school tucked away in the woods. And it's not the, like the first, right? Because last year there was um, uh, threats at Bothell High, and and it was from somebody who was out of district, like not even I don't even know what the connection was, but um, yeah, that it, it is. It's strange times to live in when that can be the impact on our communities. And I'm I'm glad that you brought it up that 
that there was, you know, a you know, a very kind and supportive community response in that in those moments and and that makes a big difference. When like if that has to be a reality, then you hope that um that people respond well. Yes, exactly. I just want to say this weekend Sunday everybody better be giving showing their mama some love. I've already ignored four presents that have shown up at my house. So I have high hopes. And also make sure your mom has air conditioning. <laughs>